Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames, messieurs, je vous prie de prendre. Please uh, take your seats and we will give the floor to the chairman of the conference, the minister, Mr. Corney. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, honorable delegates. I'd like to begin by thanking you for your uh, presence at this conference. I hope you have rested well and that everybody is ready to commence the second day of our work. I wasn't able to do so yesterday, so I'd like to thank the panelists of yesterday and the moderator for the quality and relevance of their interventions. This first panel is intended to clearly show the challenges that the sector faces. It's all about profitability and the survival of the post, globalization, the trust which is required from customers, and we need to provide them with affordable uh, services, quality services, and we need to deal with problems associated with the final mile, the last mile, and the specific nature of online uh, trade in Africa, etc. There are numerous responses. The first mentioned is predictability in, in terms of customer confidence. Uh, involving states at regulatory level and making things more effective, strengthening uh, proximity to build trust with customers at the financial level in an organization. We need to deal with things too. And the integration of technologies, communication technologies, ICTs is very important. States need to be involved at this level. Uh, accessibility, interconnectivity, and uh, the regulatory framework, framework which needs to be implemented in order to build trust with customers. It's very important. Uh, topics such as innovation and ongoing adaptation were also mentioned. Our posts have managed to resist thus far because they have uh, succeeded in taking up the challenges they've faced. Uh, they've managed to innovate and they've managed to adapt. Today, we will begin this first uh, panel uh, uh, in uh, looking at the area of effectiveness uh, and our aim is to provide regulatory responses which are required for integration in order to provide the physical and digital dimension of a postal network. The experts are here with us and they will uh, examine the regulatory responses which are required in order to promote the inclusive postal solution while guaranteeing the provision of a universal service which is effective and sustainable. I would like to say a word about the moderator uh, of today's meeting. This will be Mark Fura. He is a uh, sitting to my right. He is the president of the Swiss Federal Communication Commission, ComCom. Com. Uh, prior to becoming uh, president of that c c commission, Mr. Fura held post between 2008 and 2012 as head of the Swiss uh, regulatory authority, PostReg, and the head of the Swiss delegation to the Universal Postal Congress in Doha in 2012 as Secretary of State. This was a brief presentation, so I'd like to give you the maximum time to continue with the meeting. Mr. Fura, you have the floor. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur. Thank you, Minister. Director, Deputy General, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, it's a pleasure to see you this morning, all fresh. Guten Morgen miteinander, as we say in Bern. And, uh, uh, it will be great to discuss with you, and I thank you that you're all here. Already, though, it's a beautiful day today in Geneva, but I think we'll have an interesting morning. Yesterday, we heard a lot about innovation, a lot about e-commerce, and uh, all these things, of course, are important. It was, I must say, the first time I didn't hear the moaning that 
post email, the post mail does decline. You know, before I always said, oh well, what can we do to stop declining uh, the volume of the mail? I think it's just a fact, and it speaks for this postal sector that they accept accept this fact that people send less letters, at least in. Most of the countries send less letters and go to other ways of communications like email or like, as we heard, uh, e-commerce. And uh, the point is to find alternatives for the, the designated posts, but also for all the others who work in this sector, to find uh, alternatives to compensate, obviously, the commercial losses you have uh, by uh, the declining of the, of the, the traditional postal mail. So we will uh, dis discuss this, this kind of alternatives this morning as well, the role of, of regulators and so on. And we also discussed yesterday who makes the profit of uh, e-commerce. Is it the integrators mainly and the platforms like eBay, like Amazon, or uh, can the, in the designated posts, or generally the, the post uh, um, uh, firms, can they also have their bit? Where is the beef for the posts, is the question, or was the question yesterday? Uh, or is the post, the designated post, just the network of the leftovers, as the Canadian colleague said it. So basically, you have the service uh, universal and all these things, and the cherries get picked by the others. That is very much obviously up to the post, uh, postal uh, firms themselves, how they are entrepreneurs, how they tackle these challenges. So, the other question is, of course, what to do so we have a level playing field. And we have the same discussion in telecommunication. Some are making the infrastructure and the other use it and make the profit out of it. And of course, that is in, in our field, the discussion of net neutrality. And here, it's a discussion of level playing field. What can the, the, the governments with their uh, laws, but also the regulators do, that we have a level playing field, that not the uh, integrators can profit of the investments of, for example, the designated uh, posts who do the infrastructure for it. So what's the role of the regulators we have to discuss? Is it more regulation or is it more free market? And what is the role of the UPU as well? I think UPU is in front of big uh, challenges. They tackle these challenges. We all know that. And this discussion is part of tackling this challenge is by, by UPU. We will have this um, strategy uh, in Istanbul and we, that our discussion is preparing this strategy. We have uh, substantial uh, projects like eComPro and so on. We discussed also that yesterday. But the key question is, of course, who will do the innovations? And you know, innovations, you can't rule the innovations come from the spirit and of the, from the brain of, uh, of the people and uh, that's difficult uh, to, to, to regulate, that's difficult to direct. That is a question of creativity and of entrepreneurship and the question, the big question for the future will be do the, the posts, the designated posts and the others, do they have enough entrepreneurial a kick in the perennial engagement to uh, challenge, to take this challenge, which is brought by Amazon, by eBay, and so on. And can they do that? Do they have also the structures to do that? I think that's the big thing which we, we will have to uh, discuss. I was yesterday quite surprised because Peter did, uh, at the end, I think, he did a question to the panelists, you know, and asked the very, uh, I think, crucial question, um, who will be the winners of e-commerce? Will it be the integrators like eBay or will it be the designated posts or the private postals? And I was surprised that half of the panelists said, no, it will be the integrators, those, the newcomers, the new entrants in the sense who, who will bring new models. And I think that should, be, should alarm us and uh, say what to do that the others can, as I say, like in fencing, like take the 
direct uh, attack uh, in, the, in the commercial sense and also bring alternatives, new products and new services so they can survive well in this, in this uh, competition. So I'm coming to, to, the, to the discussion of today. Today, clients will be in the center, even more than yesterday, in the center of our discussion, and it's the small and medium enterprises. Because in all economy, we all know that if uh, the small and medium enterprises are not living well, don't have enough uh, possibility to do their business, a, uh, an economy like that has big problems. So it is important and it's crucial for our economies to see how the small and the medium enterprises can profit of this new world of e-commerce. And uh, this, 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 how they can take the opportunities, how they see the opportunities and take the opportunities and utilize the opportunities of e-commerce. But for all that, we need an e-commerce without obstacles. Um, we heard yesterday again from the Canadian uh, colleague who said crossover e-commerce is still very, very difficult. And if we don't bring down these obstacles, we will have big problems with e-commerce and we will have a detortion of competition. So, especially in the first uh, panel, we will discuss how can we bring down these obstacles. There's still a lot of red tape with customs and so on with this uh, bureaucracy and so on. The next uh, panels will discuss the role of the regulators in these uh, things. Regulators, of course, shouldn't make the obstacles higher. It's the opposite. Regulators should be facilitators. At least me as an old regulator, I've always seen my job like that, whether it's a postal regulation, the financial regulation, or the telecom regulation. We should be facilitators and not like the Moroccan colleague said yesterday, castrateur, regulateur comme castrateur. I never heard it so blatantly, but uh, he <laughs> it's uh, having been many, many years in Morocco, I understand uh, this, this picture. We're having worked with, uh, with horses. But uh, as I'm certainly, uh, but of course, the question is how can we be um, facilitator? And we have many regulators on the podium uh, to discuss that. And of course, the role again of the UP. What is the role? I mean, President Val of the uh, Post, uh, France Post said it very clearly: the UP should be the socket of the e-commerce. Uh, system. So that should be, the rules should be done by the UPU for all of us. That would be the ideal uh, thing and that was very encouraging for us all, but of course especially also for the UPU. And then also in the last panel we talk about the service public, service universal. We probably didn't um, talk that much yesterday about that. This is important. A national Service universal, because we all know politically it doesn't go without that. If in Switzerland you don't uh, send the letters properly uh, to the least uh, valley in the Canton Valley or Canton Grison, you have a tremendous political problem. My colleagues from the regulatory uh, authority of Switzerland know that. Closing a postal office there is very, very difficult. And uh, that is the case everywhere. But there's also a service universal globally, internationally. I've just been, had the honor to be two weeks ago in the Ivory Coast. And I've seen the, the challenges. I've discussed that with all uh, East and West uh, African uh, colleagues of the, of the governments and of the regulators and uh, the challenges you have there. So I think sometimes we discuss e-commerce just from uh, industrialized countries, but of course they have completely different uh, situation, a different framework and also that we would like to discuss uh, this morning because it was yesterday interesting, the lady from the UNCTAD showed us a figure which showed very clearly the growth of e-commerce is in Asia, West Europe and North America, but not in South America, not in Africa, and not in Eastern Europe. So what happens there? So if we talk about e-commerce, we should also uh, see, uh, see this problem. 
Anyway, so that's, uh, that's my introduction to the day. Now I would like to go immediately to the first um, panel. And the first panel is trade facilitation and the development of micro, small and medium enterprises through the postal networks, or with other words, to bring down all the obstacles we have. And um, I welcome the panelists here. And I would like to uh, just uh, start with uh, the first one, it's uh, Mr. Yi Jiojun, he's Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization, WTO. I already apologize for my Chinese pronunciation, which is undoubtedly wrong, but I'll go next week to China to, to practice. Anyway, Mr. Yi uh, as was uh, China's ambassador to the WTO. He re represented China as a key negotiator in China's WTO accession process, a very a crucial process, as we know. He is basically um, a big specialist in, in uh, trade negotiations. He was also China's vice minister of commerce, and um, he negotiated numerous free trade agreements, including the China-ASEAN agreement. Um, he was also, after becoming China's ambassador to the WTO, Mr. Yi was elected as the chair of the working party of the accession of Laos, PDR, and showed effective leadership in process leading to WTO membership for Laos. So Mr. Yi also knows, obviously, the problems of China, but also of um, the neighboring countries of China, but now as a deputy director general of WTO, he knows uh, uh, the problem, the global problem of the world trade. Mr. Yi, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for giving me the floor. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure for me to be here at the UPU World Strategy Conference. And uh, in particular, uh, my thanks go uh, 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 also for inviting me to this panel discussion. I would like to focus my uh, remarks on e-commerce. And uh, as you all know that uh, uh, e-commerce is one of the most important developments in the past decade. And then I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the role played by postal sector. As we all uh, see that uh, the rapid ICT advances have a direct and profound effect on the way people communicate and do business. In this context, the e-commerce has expanded significantly in the past decade and will continue to grow According to the latest uh, uh, information economy report of ANTAD, in 2013, the value of global B2B e-commerce exceeded 15 trillion US dollars and B2C 1.2 trillion dollars. Here, uh, postal services played a very important and key role in e-commerce as they handle the physical delivery of online ordered goods. At the same time, the postal sector is also reaping the benefits of e-commerce boom. In the past decade, the handling of parcels has become increasingly important for the post postal sector in terms of both volume and value. Well, the number of letters has declined significantly. <clears throat> Parcel traffic has surged by more than 30% since 2000. It is largely due to e-commerce. In some regions, over one third of the total revenues of posts are generated by parcel delivery. The potential benefits presented by e-commerce include enhanced participation in international value chains, greater market access, improved market efficiency, as well as lower transaction costs. Well, so far it is mostly large multinational companies 
that have benefited most from e-commerce. It is believed that SMEs, especially those in developing countries, have the greatest potential to benefit from the e-commerce. As we all know, in, in both developed and developing countries, SMEs make up a, a majority of business and em employ ma majority of workers in both manufacturing and services sectors. E-commerce may play an instrumental role in helping SMEs find new business opportunities, reduce production and transaction costs, and thus increase their competitiveness. A number of studies show that more and more SMEs in developing countries have engaged in e-commerce, marketing their goods and services online. There's one convergence in WTO that WTO rules do not preclude trade by electronic means. This means that e-commerce actually benefits from certainty and predictability provided by the world trading system. The WTO's new trade facilitation agreement is a very important one, which is reached December 2013 in Bali, Indonesia. The agreement is expected to improve merchandise trade flows resulting from e-commerce as it eases the customs procedures and processing for trade in goods that are increasingly purchased online today. It allows the action, uh, it allows the option of electronic payments for duties, taxes, fees, and the charges collected by customs. In the area of services trade, the General Agreement on Trade in Services in WTO also applies to postal services and other services relevant for e-commerce. So the GATT has established rules for greater transparency, non-discrimination, and competition. Cross-border postal services have existed for centuries. Despite challenges from electronic means of communications, the postal sector remains an important component of today's global economy, which generating about 350 billion US dollars at revenue in 2013 globally, we noticed that liberalization and competition in the postal sector provide incentives for postal operators to embrace new technologies and explore new business opportunities. The active engagement of posts in e-commerce is a good example in this regard. For instance, the designated postal operators in several countries has partnered with Amazon and other e-commerce companies to deliver their packages. Further, the postal sector has a great potential to help SMEs overcome important obstacles to e-commerce. For instance, the postal network is the largest physical network in the world connecting 640,000 postal outlets which makes it a cost-effective method for connecting people and the business, especially SMEs, to the global e-commerce. In addition to delivery services, SMEs can also benefit from other services provided by posts, such as internet access, financial and logistics services, which are all crucial to e-commerce. Finally, let me conclude by saying that we highly appreciate the contribution made by postal sector to, to the world trade 
and its role in trade facilitation. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yi. That was very interesting as an important introduction from the WTO because basically that's what we talk about. Now I give the floor to Mrs. Arancha Gonzalez, Executive Director of the International Trade Center. Unfortunately, Mrs. Gonzalez has to leave us at 10 o'clock, so I'm changing the, 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 the presenter's number. And uh, it's a pleasure to present you, Mrs. Gonzalez. She is an expert in international trade issues. She has 20 years of experience, and she serves as an Executive Director of the ITC since September 2013. Before joining the ITC, Ms. Gonzalez served as a Chief of Staff to the World Trade Organization and uh, with Mr. Lamy, working very closely with Mr. Lamy at the time. She was before, uh, she had held several positions at the European Commission also in these uh, tra uh, world of trade agreements. Uh, she is a lawyer and she's originally from, as I understand, from Madrid. Please, you have the floor, Mrs. Gonzalez. Thank you for this invitation to the UPU. I'm pleased to share with you from the point of view of an agency which is part of the United Nations and the World Trade Organization, and the aim is to help small and medium enterprises to globalize. The topics which you have chosen for this event uh, is music and areas. Thank you to Cote d'Ivoire too for providing us with some color. It's always welcome in Geneva. Cheese uh, for you. Message number one, logistical efficiency, um, Improvements in the facilitation of trade is an essential ingredient for the competitiveness of a small and medium enterprises. So we talk a lot about building productive capacity. We think in the International Trade Center that maybe we are not paying enough attention to logistical uh, um, elements, logistical efficiency and trade facilitation as part of this logistical uh, efficiency, which is again essential to support uh, micro, small and medium enterprises being part of value chains, which is what uh, international trade is today. So reducing the, the cost of trading is not just um, something that is good, it's something that for SMEs is essential. It's the difference between being confined to a domestic market or being allowed uh, to uh, go in search of broader markets uh, starting uh, with the region. This is why we are extremely happy that uh, WTO members uh, reached an agreement on trade facilitation, which we think when implemented, and I say when and not if, when implemented, uh, would reduce tremendously the cost of trading uh, for economic operators. So we think effective uh, facilitation is a global positive and this is why uh, we think it's very important that organizations like UPU take this and put this at the heart of uh, its agenda. Because to solve logistical efficiency, to address the trade facilitation, we are going to need a very strong public-private partnership. Private operators, whether big multinationals or small or medium and micro, Pri uh, public uh, entities within the government, from ministries of trade to ministries of finance to responsibles of customs to, uh, and the list goes on, to a concerted effort at the side of the uh, agencies internationally that can support this global effort at streamlining um, operations uh, of customs. This is why in the International Trade Center, we are focusing at the moment on supporting countries implement the trade facilitation agreement, understand where uh, countries have already met the WTO standard, understand where gaps remain, and uh, derive from their bankable projects to uh, improve the areas where a bit of work remains to be done. Number two, message number two. 
Tree facilitation is more than borders. Tree facilitation uh, and logistical efficiency is also about the design of regional integration. It's also about non-tariff measures beyond, behind the borders. Uh, it's also about procedures and procedural complexities. It is also about quality. It's also about cross-border trade and cross-border trade facilitation. So we think we have to think in our view of trade facilitation in a wider context so that we don't only tackle parts of it, but we tackle the entire chain. Third message, what's the role of the post and what's the role of uh, the UPU in this debate? I think the UPU has a big role uh, to play in this discussion. First, obviously, uh, in the postal delivery of goods, of which there is still an untapped potential, uh, in particular for SMEs. So in the area of customizing delivery services to buyers is an area where we think, from what we see on the ground, uh, it would merit uh, a bit of an action on the side of uh, all of you. Two, obviously, in reforming postal services for greater efficiency, again, as a contribution to reducing costs. Three, in uh, the new opportunities that you have for addressing what we would call transactional part of B2B. There, uh, it's, um, for example, uh, areas like linking e-payment solutions with single windows, uh, such as, for example, uh, interagency coordination between border agencies to allow for postal operators to have uh, to enjoy pre-arrival treatment and clearance. So there is a big, again, a big role uh, that we see for the postal services in these discussions on trade facilitation. Um, let me, uh, let me end uh, by uh, uh, mentioning that um, veo en esta discusión dos... There are two dimensions in this discussion. One is the UPU dimension as regulator and another as the UPU as a player in simplifying assistance to small and medium enterprises in order to, allow them to develop their trades as... Our moderator said, developing countries have problems in adopting uh, e-commerce solutions. They are lagging somewhat behind. There's a different reality though in the field. I can say there are many countries, which are developing countries, which are using technology because they have access to technology, but they need regulatory systems and operators in the field which will facilitate the use of technology. One example of this is a project which we are currently uh, developing in North Africa, in Morocco, Egypt and Tunisia. We are creating, with assistance from the World Bank and the European Union, a, a virtual uh, market for small and medium enterprises. There is a major task uh, we face and a space for all to participate and for all postal operators. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Please, I uh, ask you a question. Sure. If you would have a wish, what two or three things would you wish to be improved in these uh, uh, bringing down the obstacles in the, in the trade, in the e-commerce. You, you me mentioned now several things, but if you would say these and these and these are the main problems uh, which have to, be, uh, have to go down. Well, the first one, it would be first better leverage technology. I'm still amazed that one goes uh, through customs having to do papers and stamps and papers and stamps. And again, this is not just... Uh, an issue for developing countries. There are many developed countries where this is still the case. So use electronic solutions, because these are the solutions that are better um, for small and medium enterprises, again, who are technologically savvy, but need to make their operations uh, more agile. Two, uh, have in mind 
that trade today is not an issue of nations trading with nations. It's, there is a huge regional dimension in trade. So thinking about uh, it, when you regulate, uh, especially those of you that are party to uh, regional groupings, to regional integration processes, make sure that you regulate with the regional uh, 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 dimension in mind so that it is not uh, just simply the national lens that, uh, that you use uh, uh, when, uh, when regulating, when uh, selecting uh, the manner in which you are going to design uh, your operations. So simplify by using leveraging uh, technology uh, and uh, think regional. And my third wish would be think micro, small and medium enterprises. Think of simpler of course, respecting security, safety, which is essential when we talk trade and when we talk cross-border. But think also that the 98% of the economic tissues of your countries, and this is true also north to south, east to west, are micro, small and medium enterprises. So think of solutions that are going to be adaptable for them. Thank you very much. I Pleasure. think you were very clear. Thank you very much and have a good day. You. And uh, you were very clear in your uh, messages, which is very useful for our uh, further discussion. Now I can give the floor to Mr. Geo Zhang Zhu, Director of the World Customs Organization. Mr. Uh, Zhu, you've heard the wishes of, of Senora Gonzalez. Now you can uh, deliver the wishes. Uh, just to introduce you quickly, you are the Director of uh, World Customs Organization. Uh, in 2000, you became the director of compliance and facilitation there, and uh, you had before uh, jobs at the permanent mission of China to the European Union in Brussels. You have a degree of Masters of Public Administration of the Kinghua University in China, but you as a specialist of customs, we will be very interested to listen to your presentation. Thanks. You have the floor. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> so, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank UPU for inviting the WCO to be here to, to this uh, very important World Strategy Conference. So, I'm very happy and honored to be here to brief the conference on the work the WCO has been done in the past years and the cooperation with the UPU and and I will also brief you on the, how to say, our joint efforts to fight against the challenges, difficulties, and problems facing us in the future. So, <clears throat> to be strict, according to the UNCTAD, in 1999, approximately 300 million people had internet access globally, and nearly 25% of them made online purchase that year and the total e-commerce sales were about 110, million, 110 billion US dollars. But by the end of 2014, last year, there were around 3 billion people online, and 40% of them participated in the e-commerce, and taking the global business to consumer scale to surpass 1.5 billion trillion, including domestic and international transactions. So 15 years, 15 times increase. So this offers huge opportunity for growth in e-commerce and online shopping, leading to exponential increase in small parcels that postal services around the world are uniquely positioned to handle and deliver at low cost. And of course, a large chunk of these shipments emanate from MSA. MSMEs. So, with their universal service model, wider outreach and years of operational experiences and a reasonable cost, uh, postal services in many countries have a competitive advantage over private carriers when it comes to moving smaller parcels. So, here I would just inform you 
the WCO's initiatives, and also, as just mentioned, the cooperation collaboration with UPU. So for many years, the WCO has been at the front, forefront in the development of international standards for customs and also in the promotion of electronic data exchange and e-commerce in customs environment. So recognizing the significance of e-commerce, the WCO adopted the Baku Declaration on E-commerce in the year 2011, or 2001. So, and it developed its e-commerce strategy for customs. The WCO's immediate release guidelines, the latest version adopted last year in 2014, further support e-commerce and assist both customs and trade with expert, expediting the clearance of large number of small or negligible value goods across borders on provision of minimum data in advance, of course. So the RKC, the revised Kyoto Convention, uh, Kyoto Convention the, uh, the, the Information and Communication Technology Guidelines, so which is updated in 2014, also provide a detailed outline on how customs can use these technologies to enhance program delivery and plan improvements in their services to clients and trading partners. So the WCO's recommendation on dematerialization of supporting documents adopted in 2012 and the lately updated compendium on how to build single window environment further support e-commerce by encouraging our members to identify supporting documents that are normally required to accompany the that accompany the cargo and goods declarations and examine the need thereof with a view to eliminating them. So, of course, the specific Annex J Chapter 2 of the revised Kyoto Convention, which deals with the customs provisions specifically applicable to postal traffic, providing a simplified declaration, so that is CN 22 and 23 form, and also clearance and duty payment process. So here, I'm, I'm glad to inform you, as of March 2015, uh, 98 WCO members had acceded to RKC, and 22 of them have in addition accepted specific Annex J2. So another important provision to facilitate speedy clearance of low-value consignments, the transitional standards 4.13 of the general annex of the RKC requires contracting parties to specify in their national legislation a minimum value and or minimum amount of duties and taxes below which no duties and taxes will be collected. So dear delegates, customs and posts, have very good cooperation and have been working together over 50 years and established a contact committee in 1965. So which has since provided an excellent, excellent platform for posts and customs to talk openly with each other in a spirit of cooperation and mutual understanding and has delivered tremendous results. So last year, the WCO and the UPU jointly published two documents to enhance cooperation between customs and posts at national level. One is the joint WCO-UPO Postal Customs Guide. Two, the joint WCO-UPO guidelines for developing a MOU between customs and the UPU and posts. Of course, changes have also been made to EMS version. So of the CN23 customs declaration with a view to facilitation, facilitating the customs clearance of EMS items. So in addition to that, another important area to facilitate e-commerce is to improve electronic interface with posts and customs and how to expedite advanced electronic exchange of data. 
So which enables customs to carry out necessary risk management and take a timely decision to either allow quick release of a postal shipment or carry on its inspection. So additional, additionally, electronic data exchange between posts and customs is expected to facilitate track and trace of postal shipments and enhance service delivery, especially in dealing with the growing number of, post, of postal shipments. So to that end, a joint working group is currently engaged in developing a set of recommendations, guidelines, good practice on advanced electronic exchange of information. And another joint working group is looking into various issues related to the e-commerce with a view to develop a collaborative solutions to support this growing sector. Of course, while securing compliance with security and other regulatory requirements. The WCO and the UPU have also collaborated to jointly develop the electronic messages compliant with the WCO data model to limit pre-advice and a possible pre-clearance of postal items. The UPU Postal Technology Center has developed an electronic customs declaration system, so CDS, on the basis of the joint WCO UPU customs post message. So some pilots uh, are currently under progress, and more countries uh, such as Canada and the US, and more countries are likely to join soon. For example, Australia and the UK. So, <laughs> because I have too many to, to, to inform you, although I shortened it, but I, I, I think you want to listen to what we have been doing. If, if you, okay, I will try to shorten it. So besides EDI, customs administrations are taking several initiatives, not only at the policy level, but at the operational level as well. For example, 24-7 clearance, e-payment of duties and taxes, and e-duty calculator, and mobile-enabled services. So another thing I would like to mention is that the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement was agreed, just as uh, Ms. D mentioned, in Bali in December last, uh, in 2013, and then the protocol adopted on 27 November last year. So, among others, it provides for several measures for expeditious release and clearance of shipments, in particular air shipments, including postal items, such as uh, pre-arrival processing, separation of release from final determination of duties and taxes, and electronic payment, and expedited release on minimum documentation. So WCO has all the tools and, the, uh, uh, tools and instruments, and also has a big pool of expert, expertise, exp experts. So we, will, we also developed a, a Mercado program. We will, how to say, to effectively and efficiently to implement the FTA. So we entered into force, of course. So dear delegates, we have, together with the UPU, have done much in the past. And we will have more to do together in the future. So I'm confident our collective efforts would go a long way in simplifying and improving postal customs processes to support MSMEs to leverage the growing e-commerce for catalyzing electronic uh, eco economic growth and prosperity. So thank you for your attention and your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhu. <laughs> what I liked in this presentation is it's not nations to nations, it's firms to firms, it's clients to clients, work in regions. And we have to simplify declaration and speed up uh, the whole procedure. I think that is uh, very interesting. And it's also interesting how WCO and UPU work closely together and, of course, have to work closely together. Now, thank you very much. and. Uh, 
I give the floor now to Mr. Friber Quisbeck Racheda, he's the Director General of Peru's Serpost. The interesting thing is, you know, now we heard it on the multinational level, but of course the big question is how do you do it on the national level, level on the authorities either or on the operational uh, basis? And in South America, as we know, they try to implement this, what just uh, you said from the WCO, is implement uh, this easier uh, clearing, this easier declaration, working regionally together. And it will be interesting uh, to hear from um, Mr. Friberg, Quisbeck, Rajeda, uh, to hear how they do it in Peru. Mr. Rajeda is currently the general manager of the postal services of Serpost in Peru. That's the Peruvian post. He has been always a specialist in, uh, <clears throat> in making easy export, import easy, and to, to really make the way clear for e-commerce to bring down the obstacles. So he is the ideal uh, speaker to see it from the practical uh, side. Mr. Grajeda is a lawyer by profession and has over 12 years of experience in the postal sector. You have the floor. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I would prefer to talk to you in my native language, I mean in Spanish. Thank you. Thank you once again. It's important for us as a postal operator to be present here to share with you a tool which we've worked on for a number of years. We've, of course, support of Brazil, which initiated this system, but we've uh, managed to further develop it and add elements. And in our opinion, it's important to uh, further develop what needs to be done, what's been commented on by representatives. As Arantxa said, the development of technology is important as an instrument and we're going to share this with you in the presentation. The Easy Export program in Peru uh, came about in 2007. There was a major problem for us. It's a major program for us. We developed it with other countries of the region in Latin America and it's achieved great success. And we are proud that in our region, posts, official posts are developing uh, uh, postal exports, parcels exports to other countries using this instrument. Of course, e-commerce is growing and our aim is that as a country, as a state, we want to generate an instrument which facilitates uh, exports of parcels uh, to international destinations. I'd like to share with you and to point out that Exporta Facil in Peru is an integrated uh, project. It's a tool which is used through the postal service, through posts, and in developing it, in promoting it, in strengthening it, there are other institutions which are involved at state level. Not only the post as a logistics operator, but we have the, the customs uh, organization in Peru which promotes this tool uh, at the international level too. Here you can see uh, three institutions in order to put you a clearer picture of what's happening. And these institutions are involved in promotion of this instrument. However, there are two stakeholders uh, which are very strongly involved that's to say the Postal Service, the Post, and Customs. And in this connection, we play an important role. Through Exporta Facil, we want to uh, develop uh, technology. This is uh, what differentiates things in Peru. Exporters, when they wish to perform exports, don't need to fill in forms. This is all done through the web page of the customs in Peru and this information is interconnected with a post so that we uh, receive the information and the processing uh, uh, and dispatch of items uh, uh, abroad is immediate. Of course it's true that we need to innovate. 
it's not only about exporting products abroad through this tool, but it's also uh, about rec meeting requirements of the market uh, in the area of international trade, uh, international sales, and we've managed to de develop things accordingly through Exporter Facile. It's an instrument which allows us to facilitate uh, imports uh, from other countries to Peru. And we are currently working with Brazil in this connection. So the export of Facil uh, is uh, connected with Brazil through an import of Facil, easy import system, in the opposite direction, if you will. So what's the Easy Export program? To summarize, it allows products to be exported weighing up to 30 kilos and with an FOB value of up to $5,000 per custom declaration. But due to the growth uh, of this product, uh, we are developing so much that in Peru, we hope we will increase this amount of $5,000 to maybe $10,000. Exporter Facile is an instrument which is a small and medium enterprises, as a rancher said, and we can share with you that in Peru in 2008, we've got micro, small and medium enterprises at a total of 659,000. This product can, of course, be used by big businesses too, but on a smaller scale. It's designed for MSMEs. As you can see here, through the Sunout webpage, there's a whole process which is conducted the registration, the online uh, filling in of all the information. So what are the benefits uh, of exporting via Exporter Facil? What are the export benefits of country for the exporters too? Well, first, the exporters save money. It's quite simple. Uh, a natural person can do it. A physical person or a legal person can do it. Uh, what's important is in the world of exports and to facilitate things, there's no need to have a customs broker. This is perhaps the most relevant aspect because uh, this costs a great deal, this process. There is great coverage at the national level. This means that we have to be covered, technologically speaking, so that all our post offices are able to receive uh, uh, items and, and conduct the export process. So we have uh, points where the exports can be received uh, every day of the year, 365 days, 24 seven. One topic which is important is that small uh, exporters can have access to the mechanism and they're considered exporters as such. And as a result, they benefit uh, from uh, discounts and from tax facilities uh, uh, for small and medium enterprises, uh, export of facile represents major opportunities. It allows them to uh, access international markets, it opens up windows to other countries. And it's an inclusive factor. Uh, prior to this system in Peru, above all, if you wanted to export, then you had to go to the capital in order to have access to the international market. Through the system, you don't need to now. You can access the system through any point of Peru now. You can export from anywhere. What then are the achievements? We have more than $18 million in exports via Exporter Facile. If we consider things in uh, international currency, it's triple that amount. We've got more than 43,000 statements, transactions more than 5,600 MSMEs which have used the system. It's an important uh, impact it's making and 40% of the exports go to the United States of America and 21% to Europe. What matters with this system is that it allows us to uh, complement other uh, services such as money order services and there are other benefits which are available and we're working on that in order to further strengthen the system. They've got a little video I'd like to share with you now. It'll last three minutes and it will allow you to appreciate the importance of this tool for exporter facilis. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Grache. That was very interesting. Thank you. And Thank you. I think we saw it from the practical point and uh, from South America, which is very active, which is, we heard it yesterday, sometimes emerging countries are leapfrogging uh, in the technology, in the exactly. adaptation of these rules and can be a good example for, let's say, Western European or uh, North American countries. Now I would like to give the floor to a representative of the Caribbean. It's Mr. Sandra Tavoren. Please uh, take the floor. She is the Secretary General of the Caribbean Postal Union. She has this position since 2014. She is also a Postmaster General of St. Kitts and Nevis. Mrs. Uh, Davoren is from St. Kitts and Nevis, travelled a long way here. And uh, she is uh, in, their, in her role, she was assisting the Post in developing new products and improving the quality of service of St. Kitts and Nevis, but of the whole region. As a uh, profession, she was before teacher, she comes from education, and I think that's not a bad thing to start to, to start the career by educating the posts and the regulators how to do the thing. So we'll be interested of your presentation, Mrs. Davorn, you have the floor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I deem it an honor and certainly a privilege to be able to represent the Caribbean Postal Union at this conference, and I want to thank the UPU for their invitation for me to do this. As we look at the topic, trade facilitation and the development of MSMEs, micro, small, and medium enterprises through the postal network, I will share with you our ideas and experiences as a Caribbean. Men and women the world over have had to rely on MSMEs for their livelihood. Studies have shown that they contribute significantly to the gross domestic profit of countries. They are often considered the lifeblood for many countries. And they are very resilient in their nature despite the many setbacks they often experience. The genesis of an MSME is usually an individual with a brilliant idea for creating employment and wealth, and this usually requires funding that the individual or individuals can ill afford. Depending on the type of business, the overhead expenses can be highly high, especially if it's a manufacturing business, for example, the making of bread and pastries or just making clothing. Some of these business owners, however, are not technologically savvy, and in other instances, they don't have access to the internet, and that, of course, would give them an e-commerce experience of trading globally if they did have that. Also, there are some lengthy custom procedures which usually create setbacks for them, and in many instances, they cannot afford to pay a broker to do these tasks. An electronic payment facility set up in post offices could greatly assist these businesses as some of them would like to transfer funds or make payment to other businesses or suppliers in different locations within the countries or even within the region. For example, an MSME would like probably to transfer funds from Barbados to another supplier in St. Kitts or even in the BVI, the British Virgin Islands. Also, post offices are strategically located in villages so that access to post offices is quite easy. They are dotted across the countries so that you don't, for example, sometimes you might not have to leave the rural area to go to find one in the capital, for example. And so a, a business owner, a small business owner, might want to transfer funds from a rural post office in, and transfer those funds to another post of another business in the capital. And if those experiences 
are provided for them, the facility is provided for them, then that would be great, especially through the post. We have already established here that the post is a trusted organization the world over. And in countries like St. Kitts, Barbados, and the British Virgin Islands, where, pro where they provide funding programs for SM MSMEs, it would be really best if these programs are done through the post, thereby giving the post an opportunity to partner with these businesses. In St. Kitts, for example, there's a program called SEED, SEED, an acronym. It affords citizens the opportunity to start their own businesses by providing them with training and interest-free loans ranging from 5,000 to 100,000 EC dollars. And each entrepreneur is assigned a business manager and an accountant for at least one year contracted at no cost to the business to help ensure the profitability and success of this venture. That is why we think that these businesses can come through the post office where we can greater assist them. In another location, for example, like Guyana, MSMEs who have a difficulty finding a place to operate their businesses the post affords them the opportunity to rent premises located in close proximity to the post office so they could ply their trade. Post also can provide access to technology through internet cafe services hosted at post offices. Entrepreneurs who don't have the technology can come into the post offices, surf the internet and find markets for their goods and purchase raw materials and goods to assist them in their business. The world at their fingertips at the click of a button. The provision of a US mailbox service is another way that posts in the Caribbean help to facilitate e-commerce. There are post offices in St. Kitts, in Anguilla, in St. Vincent, the British Virgin Islands, St. Lucia, just to name a few, that provide a mailbox facility in the US. The customers send the goods they purchase online to these facilities, and then they are delivered to the different countries. Also, when customers purchase goods online, they want to know that their goods are delivered to them in a timely and efficient manner. Hence, the development of websites through the use, probably, of dot post or other methods which, allow, which would allow MSMEs the opportunity to track and trace and return merchandise. Post office, again, can assist them by providing a reliable and efficient delivery service. And sometimes this is done by providing the goods or sending or taking their goods to their doorsteps. Post can create also opportunities to collaborate with governments and encourage governments to review or create the requisite legislation that would assist MSMEs in their business trade. In the Caribbean, for example, there are many cottage industries that are run by women. In many cases, they are homeowners and the sole providers for their families. We, as a region, aim to provide them with access to global markets and at the same time, target the increase in women in industry, both on a national and global level. Again, I would like to make reference to a program in St. Kitts that is called WISE, Women in Small Enterprise Development, and the government there is doing quite a lot to assist these women. Finally, we all recognize that the advent of technology and the internet will continue to change the way people do business. This phenomena have caused posts to change their most modus operandi and make the requisite paradigm shift so that we can meet the needs and expectations of our customers. Customers are demanding more, and they will find ways to get their needs met. This will cause MSMEs to grow and continue in the future to be the engine for innovative and new services in our region. We have acted effectively within our region, and there's still more that we can do. However, we think that there is 
a lot of benefit from interregional cooperation. For example, we have heard yesterday about innovation and new initiatives, new products and services being offered around the world. But the challenge is, how can we as a region utilize the UPU network to dip into and learn from other regional and international innovations and get best practices for the benefit of our customers? We are not homogeneous and are, not diff and are at different stages of development in the Caribbean. But with hard work and dedication to the task, it is definitely possible. The post is here to stay. But POST must divine, define their USO and take advantage of the IPDP programs that the UPU has offered, and this would assist greatly with reform. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Sandra Davor, and it was very interesting, and it shows the importance also of the post offices. Yes, David discussed a lot about where to deliver it, you know. We even had this example of somebody taking a picture of the entrance of the house, lack of postal address, and then send it to the one who has to deliver it. Now, here we heard the about uh, the necessity of the post offices and of the infrastructure and of the teaching of the people there in the post office so you can send off uh, your goods which you produce somewhere in a rural area. This was very, very interesting. Both examples, Peru, South America, and also from uh, the Caribbean. Now, uh, we don't have much time, unfortunately, but I just have one question to the panel. Uh, it's a very easy question, and I expect a very short and uh, quick answer. What is for you still the main obstacle in e-commerce uh, which has to be tackled. Just one, just as you, you, the, the, if you, you ask the main obstacle, what would it be? How do you see it, Mr. Young? For most, for most of developing countries, I think they need to have, uh, the poor people need to have uh, infrastructure. And uh, they need to have uh, uh, free regulation to allow the e-commerce to, uh, uh, to proceed. So, infrastructure and free regulation. Mr. Grajeda? Well, for us, we believe that one of the obstacles which is present in our region in terms of e-commerce, we see it from two perspectives. First, in terms of raising awareness. We have to raise awareness of potential exporters and train them. And also, we need to facilitate regulatory issues to facilitate exports. And a third point I'd like to include here in my comment uh, is the role played by the Universal Postal Union in this uh, topic. And all the countries we send uh, uh, our mail to, uh, it's recognised as, uh, export as is recognised as being an important aspect of a postal service. So I take, you gave three. I take one, awareness is very important what they understand, is that right? Mr. Um, uh, Gua Zhong Zhu, how do you see it? What is uh, the main obstacle? I'm sure you will not say the customs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for us, the main ob obstacles is uh, two sides. One is uh, how to keep the best balance between facilitation and compliance. So it's not easy to keep the balance. And of course, we will strength the cooperation with uh, stakeholders, including UP UPS and also the customs self-modernization. Okay, Mrs. Davorn, what is the main obstacle? As always, the woman has the last word. <laughs> so what, how do you do see it? Well, one would... one, one uh, point, not, not five. Okay, I would say one of the main obstacles we have to get by is the changing of the legislation that would give us more opportunities to create advantage, um, to create situations for them to access the technology that they need to do business. Access to technology. That's, access that's to technology. Thank you very much. A quick opening to the floor, then we have to go to the next panel. Who would like to take the floor? But here I give one rule, and I'm pretty, pretty brutal. It's, uh, we discuss here, so it's not, no long statements, no long questions, just a one minute question or statement, whatever, but please no declarations. 
who would like the floor to this top topic? Okay. Oh yes, I can see. Is that is that uh, Nigeria? Please, you have the floor. Uh, the question I want to ask um, uh, uh, Peru and uh, uh, the Caribbean: What is the um, profitability or the, the 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 quantum of business regarding this initiative? Thank you. Please, uh, Peru, and then Mrs. Savorin. Yes. The profitability for us is uh, aimed at increased use of uh, export. So it's profitable for us, of course. There is social profitability too, which means uh, making available to our citizens, to Peruvians, to be able to use this uh, facility to export to other countries. Mrs. Taborn. The greatest profitability for us nationally is it helps to reduce unemployment when these MSMEs get the opportunity to start a business. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, the panelists, Mr. Jajun uh, Yi, uh, Mr. Friber Quispe Rajeda, uh, Mrs. Arancha Gonzalez, Mr. Guajong Zhu, and Mrs. Sandra Daborn for participating for your very interesting and competent uh, presentation. And uh, I uh, declare this uh, panel as finished and we still go on as we are working very hard with no breaks to the next panel. That's the panel five and I ask uh, the panelists to come to the floor. It's Mr. Saidi Abdul Karim, uh, Mrs. Lina Rainiene, uh, Mr. Mutuna Mutusi and uh, Mrs. Victoria Sukulik and Professor John Nkoma. Please take the seat and thanks the panelists for their contribution. We go on immediately. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting sorry, discussion. sorry, yeah, that we had to be a bit short. But, I know, I know. But the interesting thing is that we have so many speakers in so many aspects. So. Sure. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very good. It was really. Sorry, I had to a bit. Uh, I know the time's constrained. Yeah, I give you my. No, no, I know. But it was interesting. I give you my card. <laughs> I gave you my phone. Oh, thank you. I gave you my phone. Thank you. See the slides. I don't know. I don't know.
So, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you please to take a seat again? Uh, please take a seat, we continue. Thank you very much and uh, thanks for uh, stopping your conversations. Though I'm very much for communication, I think uh, we would like to start with the next panel. So, ladies and gentlemen, the next panel uh, we have with the title How Regulation Can Leverage the Postal Sector in All Its dim Dimension. Already the title says that uh, re regulation could have an important role. And of course the question is, and I have to ask these as a regulator, is that really the case? Can regulation leverage the postal sector in all dimensions? Is the regulator the superman in this thing or is he not? So uh, what role does regulation have in innovation? You know, innovation is usually something which comes from enterprises, from the human being, not from the government or from the regulation, but can regulation probably do, and governments, of course, uh, ministerial policies, can they do uh, a framework for it, for innovation, for investments? Is it necessary to intervene for the regulator? Where is it necessary and where is it not necessary? what to do that regulators don't become castrators, regulateurs, deviennent castrateurs. So what is uh, uh, to do there? So what is the role of the regulator? We have very different intervenience from regulatory offices, uh, but also uh, from ministries in the next panel who can uh, see, put the light in different ways. The danger is, of course, of over-regulating. We all know that. Over-regulating stops investment, stops innovative uh, thinking, and uh, the important thing is that the regulator becomes a fa facilitator. But um, how can he, as a facilitator, improve the value chain, the new value chain, the new processes which we have in, for example, e-commerce? and uh, where is intervention necessary for regulators and where not. And then there is the other thing, we have a convergence of financial services. We heard yesterday from the Director General from UPU the importance of payment, postal banks and so on. We have more and more streams of migration. Uh, the financial aspect of uh, the postal services is very, very important. There it needs, of course, a, a financial regulator. It needs, uh, there's a convergence with telecommunication. We just mentioned SMS. Many things go together uh, with, the, with the mobile or, of course, e-commerce goes very much with online. So there is also a convergence with the telecom sector, with the financial sector. What that does mean that um, from the, on the regulatory uh, side. We also know many post offices are also internet bistros where people have the access online. So we should have a common view of regulation, not just concentrate on the postal regulation. By the way, that will be also go already into the next the panel six. There will also uh, have this issue discussing. So that is a bit the introduction to our uh, next panel and we have uh, the panelists are the followed. Mr. Maud Saidi Abdul Karim, he's Director of Postal Affairs and Digital Signature from Malaysia. We have Mrs. Lina Rainiene, Deputy Director General of Communication Regulatory Authority of Lithuania. We have Mr. Mutuma Mutusi, he's the Director of Public Affairs uh, in the Kenya Ministry of Information, Communications and Technology. We have uh, Mrs. Victoria Sekulik, she is uh, a well-known colleague from the postal sector of communications uh, of Argentina. And we have Professor John S. Nkuma, Director General of the Tanzanian Communication Regulatory Authority. I start uh, this uh, list with the um, presentation of Mr. Maud Saidi Abdul Karim, Director of the Postal, postal Affairs. And um, Mr. Mo Saidi Abdul Karim is uh, 
uh, Director of Postal Affairs and Digital Signature in Malaysia at the uh, Communication um, uh, Regulator. He's that since uh, 2000. He had a key role in Malaysia building up the modern uh, postal uh, infrastructure. He gave the legal base for the postal services. He uh, formulated also the national postal strategy and policy. And uh, many things went under the title in Malaysia, Regulate for Growth. So the policy says you need uh, a regulation for growth in the po uh, postal sector. That's very interesting. And we will uh, listen to you with much uh, interest, Mr. Um, Abdul Karim. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of Postal Administration of Malaysia, I would like to congratulate and express my highest appreciation to the UPU, the Swiss Government, and the Government of the Côte d'Ivoire for organizing this important strategic conference as we look ahead to a new World Postal Sector Roadmap and the 2016 UPU Congress in Istanbul. It is a privilege and our honor to stand in front of all of you here, the esteemed global postal leaders, policymakers, and fellow regulators, and be given this opportunity to share some of our thoughts and our experience in Malaysia on regulatory development in the changing postal sector. Indeed, we are now entering into an ex exciting phase of development in postal sector I would say that 175 years ago, we know that we're going to celebrate this year for the 175 years of the penny black of the first step. I think today, we are also entering into something similar. If penny black has changed the letter mill now, e-commerce is going to change the way we're going to regulate postal sector in this century, of course, in the next decades to come. I'm going to say that in the next few decades is a golden decade for postal sector and the future, for, the future of postal sector is in our hands. The regulator cannot decide who's going to win the battle in this sector, but the role of the regulator is to facilitate development and ensure level playing field. It is up to the imaginations of the postal players how they can modernize and innovate in this competitive and interesting era of e-commerce. The post must modernize quickly or declines, including in the field of postal regulations. The post sector must rejuvenate. The regulator also must change, and UPU also, we must rejuvenate. It is up to all of us to decide our future, and I think UPU as the global regulator and facilitator of e-commerce in future must play a more important role and a leading in e-commerce. We all know that letter post is declining and passer post is increasing, as, show, as, as shown by our panelists yesterday. E-commerce is now recognized as the most vital growth engine for the postal sector in many parts of the world, including in Malaysia and developing economies. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, it is obvious that the economics of universal service obligation, in particular the central of postal regulation in most countries, in its current form, are no longer sustainable if mail volume continues to decline year on year at a rapid speed. To safeguard the universal service on one hand and to rejuvenate the postal sector on the other, we need a fundamental change in the way we regulate and act. Indeed, this call for a delicate balancing act. The regulator must transform and act as a facilitator for delivering innovative, integrated and inclusive postal sector development agenda 
yet have to enforce the requirement of the law. The regulator plays an important role in rejuvenating the postal sector. In this respect, Malaysian postal regulatory regime has been transformed in the last few years to facilitate growth, achieve national policy objective of the postal sector, and meet the national development policy, such as to make Malaysia as a developed nation by year 2020. To this end, our National Postal Development Roadmap 2010 to 2014 has given greater emphasis on transforming the regulatory regime as well as continuing the institutional reform which has started since 1992. Malaysia passed its new postal legislation in 2012. Among the key features of the legislation are as follows. The acts require the Commission to safeguard the provision of universal service as well as to respond to technical, economics, and social environments and need of consumer. In this regard, the Commission has taken a friendlier and lighter approach in defining universal service ob obligation in Malaysia, especially in rural areas whereby the designated postal operator is given a task to develop its own rural service master plan which must be reasonably acceptable by the rural communities and the Commission. The law also incorporates three key dimensions of postal services, physical, financial, and electronics. Thus, Malaysia is ready, at least from the legislative perspective, to have a converged physical and electronic universal postals, postal regime in future. The Act is not regulating the po a postal operator, but the postal service industry ecosystem, including courier operators, direct mail, postal facility service provider. Two licensing schemes have been established, namely universal service license and non-universal service license. The postal service fund it will also be established and maintained by the Commission to rejuvenate the postal sector, include, including modernizing the rural postal service. In this connection, Malaysia is still studying a suitable model for the, the, the fund for the postal sector, which may likely commence in 2017. We believe our new regulatory model could provide solution for the regulator to deal with current postal issue like declining mail volume, sustainability of USO, as well as emerging postal issue related to security, digital posts, and e-commerce. As a developing country, Malaysia will continue to modernize its postal infrastructure and build capacity to ensure our readiness to support the explosive e-commerce growth in the next decade to come. Not only in Malaysia, within Malaysia, which has 30 million population, but also within the ASEAN region, which has close to 600 million population. The postal sector regulator and policymaker must ensure a healthy and vibrant environment within the postal sector itself in order to attract investment needed. In this regard, Malaysia has done fairly well in the global ranking. For instance, we are at number 20 in the Global Competitiveness Index number 21 in the DHL Global Connectedness Index, and number 25 in the Logistics Performance Index. In closing, I would like to reaffirm that the future of e-commerce and the posts are interwined, and the potential of e-commerce as the main revenue spinner for postal operators worldwide is indeed a reality. Postal regulator must play a central role to rejuvenate the postal sector and take immediate steps to transform modernize and overhaul their postal regulatory regime towards a growth facilitating framework. Ladies and gentlemen, we must regulate for growth and not grow our regulation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Mo Saidi Abdel Karim. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting insight. And I would like to go to the next speaker. It's the colleague from Lithuania, uh, Lina Rainiene. She's Deputy Director General uh, of the Communication Regulatory Authority of Lithuania. Lithuania has this year the chair of the ERGP, that is the, the group of um, postal regulators of Europe, and every year the chairmanship uh, changes, and this year the chair is with Lithuania. 
she is also chairing for that the CN, the contact network in the ERGP. Uh, Lena is a lawyer and she's since 2002 in this uh, National Regulatory Authority, which also deals with the telecom regulation. And she is, as a lawyer, of course, deals mainly with legal aspects, and we also know each other quite well from the BEREC. That is the pendant of the ERGP for the telecom sector. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Uh, moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here and to share uh, short insights into the progress of the, of the postal sector evolution. So, as you record already, I am from the not very big country in the middle of the uh, Europe, and uh, we facing the situation that we opened our market since more than two years already. But uh, today, I will not speaking about the opening of the market. I will uh, emphasize the issue that it is actually uh, even not important whether the market is uh, closed with some uh, exclusive rights, whether the market is in the reserved area position when some, uh, some glide path for the incumbent is, is in place, or whether there, there, are, there are no, no uh, exclusive rights at, at all at the moment. So in any case, in any case, we have the situation, and every of us, in, in every single country, we are facing the situation that alongside the incumbent, we have other players, as other operators, which are there, already active, as uh, the bulk mailers, which are uh, also uh, present in the market, and uh, uh, provide, provide the services which not always clear whether they are recognized postal, whether or not. We also have the uh, consolidators which, uh, which also are in the market, which, which play in the market. And for the bulk mailer segment, yesterday uh, we already saw that uh, they already evolved from the simple letter bulk mailers to some maybe big integrated companies which in any moment can enter the market. So this is, I think, major challenge for the, uh, for the regulator because when we look at those all market players, starting from the historical operator and ending to some potential uh, integrated operators which are not present in the postal, pure postal sector today, Actually, they all are working towards the fostering the businesses with the uh, large volumes which are growing. And as we heard uh, yesterday and, and today that, uh, okay, the latter segment is declining, but other segments are growing. And uh, luckily, those segments as a parcel segment is growing much more quicker than the other segments are declining. So. Here we have this evolution of growth in volume with some changes from the behavior of the businesses, with some expectations from the consumers. And all these issues are in front of the regulation. And in front of the regulator, it doesn't matter what the what the regulator is from country to country, whether it is the independent authority, whether it is the ministry or the in any case, someone is performing the regulatory function. So, first of all, as it was mentioned today, the uh, legal environment is important. The competition of, for the postal sector, we may call them uh, very uh, narrow rules for the competition, as we understand, or we may call in the broad sense the uh, predictable rules how the sector is working. And as Yesterday, Mr. Uh, Director General stated that all of us should, uh, should step out of our comfort zone. So I think we already done that. Uh, and from the perspective of the operators who are competing with each other and uh, thinking about the progress of their businesses, and especially for, from the regulatory side, the regulators already stepped away from the comfort zones because we should look around and we should think what is the situation in our countries? Uh, what are the rules? Because we see the market, we are closest uh, bodies to the market. We can see the pulse and we can see some obstacles from the regulation which is in present written in the country. So first of all, I think this is the challenge because uh, the worst thing that could be uh, when the legal rules 
are as an obstacle for the market evolution. So it's better sometimes to have more flexible rules which are in favor of evoluting uh, of, the, of the market player starting from the incumbent as well. So uh, the second uh, issue is just extend, uh, extend the oversight from the pure postal market as we understand today. Because, uh, as it was talked a lot yesterday and this morning session, there are so many things around going. And for the regulator, it's important to understand and to be uh, able to be able evaluate and identify the services and the players. Earlier, we had very easy situation. The postal player means providing postal services. What we are having today, today we have that Postal operator is, provide, is providing a bundle of services, which sometimes fall under other regimes, under financial regime, under logistical regime. So that means that not only operators and the market players are growing and improving these skills, but the regulator should improve the skills as well. The governments should improve their skills to understand and to, to uh, monitor what is happening in, in the market and to reflect it in the legislation of the, of the country. So uh, when we're talking about the changing business models and post, I think that the major, major challenge for the regulation is, uh, first of all, to facilitate and to, to allow market to evolve at the very initial, initial stage. And at the end, of course, everything is uh, for the sake of the, uh, of the small, medium, big businesses. And at the end of the day, we always come back to the end user. And when we ask why we need regulation or whether we need regulation, regulation also always can be very hard one or very soft one. But for the end user, for the consumer, sometimes it's even very difficult to understand what kind of service they are purchasing, whether they are purchasing the postal service, whether they are purchasing the logistical service, to whom to apply, to whom uh, to apply to solve the problem. The same issue may arise for the postal operators while providing the businesses, for the incumbent as well, because uh, the market players sometimes, of course, are eager to, to use some facilities, to use the network, or to, to, to compete within particular areas. We know the cherry picking issues. So uh, therefore, we should be trying to put our hand on the pulse and uh, just to try to, to, facilitate, uh, to facilitate the growth and, and the regulation not to keep as an obstacle for, for, the, for the evolution. So I would like to thank you for your attention and I think that the uh, major way forward also is that from the e-collection to e-delivery, it is always some kind of physical element in the, in the postal market. So the postal market still will remain as a platform having some physical element in it. Thank you for, uh, for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Lina, Lina Rainiene, Deputy Director of uh, the Lithuanian Regulatory uh, Authority. In Europe, as you have seen, the question of opening the market, liberalization is one of the key questions, which is not the case uh, in many other countries. So I think we would like to come back in the discussion with the panel uh, to that. But uh, Lina has shown the strategy, which is of the European Union and of the ERGP, in opening these markets, which is concerning, of course, mainly the mail markets. Now the next speaker is uh, Mr. Mutua Mutusi. He is the Director of Consumer and Public Affairs of the Communications Authority of Kenya. He is uh, responsible for the consumer public affairs and the international relations, of course here in UPU very well known. Uh, he does that uh, for the last 16 years. He was right from the beginning of the regulatory body in 1999, if I understand right, in, uh, in different roles in the Communications Authority of uh, Kenya. And he will be sharing with us uh, the Kenyan perspective on how regulation can leverage the postal sector. Mr. Mutuzi, you have the floor. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, and uh, I would also like to thank the chairman of the conference uh, for according us this opportunity to be able to uh, speak to this great audience. Uh, let me start by um, conveying apology of my minister who was expected to sit on the panel this morning, uh, but due to other pressing engagements uh, in Kenya, he was unable to make it. Uh, we'll try our best to represent him. Uh, the Kenya ICT landscape um, is, is divided into the policymaker, who is the ministry, the Ministry of ICT. And then we have the independent regulator, uh, the Communications Authority of Kenya, who regulates uh, the entire ICT spectra uh, from telecommunication, broadcasting, uh, postal services, and uh, uh, e-commerce. Um, within that lineup, we have the Postal Corporation of Kenya as the designated uh, postal operator. We also have uh, other licensed courier operators, uh, private uh, postal operators, uh, 214 of them. Um, and then we have uh, over 1,000 and 400 uh, postal courier outlets. Internet penetration in the country is stands at 64% now, and uh, we have uh, 26 million mobile money sub subscribers uh, in a population of uh, about 40 million. Uh, the penetration of uh, mobile services in the country is at 82.6%. Uh, uh, the last three uh, statistics I'm giving you because uh, innovation is actually taking place uh, in, 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 in the platforms that are being powered uh, by modern technology, including digital communication. Um, the uh, landscape of the legal regulatory framework, um, we now have uh, sector legislation, which is specifically addressing issues of uh, e-commerce and matters of uh, cyber security. These are very important elements of uh, innovation in the postal services uh, because as have uh, said, the, uh, most of the innovations are coming from the digital platform. And uh, of course, within those digital platforms, we need them to be secure so that players and customers can uh, 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 have peace of mind when they are transacting. We keep on uh, progressively reviewing our sector policy uh, so as to take care of uh, emerging issues to ensure that the trend in the industry uh, keeps up to the uh, 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 best standards. And the last one, unfortunately, was reviewed uh, a while ago, uh, 2006. Um, the sector guidelines are the ones that um, really guide the market operations. And uh, these ones, we recently reviewed them. And they are basically targeting emerging markets. And emerging markets are the ones where we are finding a lot of innovation coming in, uh, services that are very uh, new to the postal, traditional postal business. Um, of course, within the regulatory framework, we have uh, the license terms and conditions within which all people who are licensed to operate uh, uh, in the postal sphere uh, ought to follow. We also um, uh, take advantage of forums like here to get global perspectives and uh, best practices that we can infuse in, into our uh, regulatory market. Um, as Mr. Moderator, you say the regulators are basically enablers and facilitators of business. And uh, we do also subscribe to that in Kenya. We, uh, the regulator sees itself as the facilitator of all these uh, uh, services that are being um, undertaken within the ICT sector. Um, and in fact, our vision is to see 
uh, all Kenyans have uh, communication services by the year 2018. So we provide an enabling environment where players, all players, can compete and find use, find business um, a reason for, for existing in the country, and also for the customers to also uh, uh, take advantage of the open market and uh, be able to get value for their money. Uh, we get involved also in, uh, uh, in infrastructure development and services um, um, where we assist the playing ground to, um, so that the players in the market play within an atmosphere that has um, very good and well-developed uh, infrastructure. Um, we develop also markets. Um, so how do we regulate and foster innovation? Because we are only facilitators. We are not the ones in innovating as such. Uh, so we, we get into lots of uh, research, studies, and development uh, so that we can be at the cutting edge of what is expected in the market. Um, and this is to enable us to come up with the regulatory uh, interventions that will be able to enable all players uh, to find a um, very conducive environment where they can innovate, come up with uh, new services, uh, compete uh, in a manner that provides value to themselves and to the uh, customers. Um, capacity building, uh, we do also, as a regulator, we need to be at the cutting edge of what is happening in the market. Uh, so we carry out a lot of capacity building so that the regulator is also at a level where they can fully understand um, uh, what the operator is doing. And uh, in fact, we like being uh, ahead of them sometimes. But of course, uh, since they are the players in the market interacting with customers, uh, sometimes uh, they, are, they, are, they are far much ahead. Um, this also capacity building, also we conduct some capacity building for uh, the players in the market, the licensees, uh, to just uh, get them to, some of them understand the, the new trends in the market, because we have big and small players, and some of them we really need to assist them to get to, to the level of the cutting edge of business. Um, the, The, the Kenya Post, which is uh, the um, uh, designated uh, postal operator, uh, also has uh, a unique uh, obligation of doing the universal service obligation. And, um, uh, 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 but this is an obligation that uh, can also be given to another person. Uh, uh, but currently, these are the people who are doing it. And um, the we have seen a lot of innovation coming from the Kenya Post recently, and uh, I think one of the most celebrated is uh, the offering of uh, the government services within our post offices. Uh, we call it Huduma Centers, and uh, this is a very innovative uh, aspect of uh, postal business where we have seen uh, 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 government services uh, getting closer to the citizens uh, through the elaborate network of, of, of uh, of postal business. Uh, we, we also have seen them uh, get into uh, financial inclusion where banks are uh, uh, partnering with them, also using the, their large networks to, to, to reach their customers. Uh, a few challenges there, national addressing system, of course the issues of uh, USO, which are, are, are across, uh, I think, uh, everywhere. There's no enough money to do this all the time. And um, everybody is uh, uh, complaining they are, they are, they are contributing uh, much more than they, they would wish to do. Um, we are doing a few things to try to overcome the challenges. And uh, for the national addressing system, we have evolved uh, a national policy uh, that is uh, uh, looking at national addressing system as an infrastructure that uh, needs to be addressed from uh, a national 
uh, policy level so that it can be driven um, uh, uh, by the government and, uh, and the regulator. Legis legislations uh, on uh, USF, we have uh, ensured that uh, they, they make it mandatory for all players in the market uh, to contribute to this um, uh, kitty so that uh, it can be expanded uh, to, to reach all people. And um, uh, of course, uh, regulation of e-commerce, we, we have strengthened it by uh, addressing issues of the cyber security and um, uh, uh, within the monitoring system, we have uh, recently acquired uh, the RFID uh, from the UPU and we are rolling it out in the country uh, to be able to monitor our uh, 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 quality of service. Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Moderator, and mm -hmm. I'm uh, sorry, I think I have exceeded my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mutua Mutusi, for this interesting uh, uh, insight of uh, the work and the policy of the Communications Authority of Kenya, of the Kenyan regulator. And uh, I come now immediately to the next speaker, that's Mrs. Maria Victoria Sukenik. She's well known in the UPU, she's an advisor of the International Affairs and Communications Secretariat of Argentina. She is representative in the UPU since 2006, and uh, she Argentina's vice chair of the CA. And uh, her education is Master of International Affairs and Economics. And I give you the floor, Victoria. Please to you and to your colleague from Tanzania. As short as possible, then we have time for questions and remarks. Thanks. Okay. Good morning to all of you. First, I would like to convey uh, the best wishes of Mr. Banner, the Secretary of Communications, who wishes you every success. Uh, we're bringing you a brief presentation now. And we'd like to point out some of the basic concepts in the area of regulation, and above all, the challenges that we've identified uh, facing us in this area. I think that the main challenge, we've seen this in the presentations today and yesterday, is to ensure that a regulator is not seen uh, as a bad party uh, in the film. Through the other presentations uh, too, we've uh, emphasize this and we will continue by uh, reflecting on the matter. Uh, some of the basic uh, ideas uh, in terms of a role of a state to summarize, as we all know, are to ensure the constitutional guarantee of the availability of correspondence to secure communications and their expansion, to pursue the development of a sector and its working conditions, and to promote conditions for valid competition and above all, to pursue development, social inclusion and progress of a country. The state intervention in postal regulation ensures compliance with these objectives and the satisfaction of social needs. Many of these concepts were expressed uh, by the previous panelists and we fully share what they've said and we hope to contribute from our side, from our humble position. We understand that regulation is a tool to reconcile all interests in the sector. It is, of course, an ongoing process that faces constant challenges. Specifically, over today and yesterday, we've spoken about regulation and the various requirements seen on a daily basis through technological development and change in society in general. And our aim is to take up uh, this challenge on an ongoing basis to update ourselves. And as we've seen through the various opinions expressed, uh, it's important that regulation is practical, pragmatic and flexible. And we shouldn't be seen as a bad party in the film. Through regulation, uh, the state needs to order the market and the stakeholders and the market too. As was mentioned yesterday, our aim is to uh, ensure that clear rules are applicable to all and we defend the rights of users and workers. 
I repeat, we need to defend the rights of users and workers. I think we feel it's a very important point and we uh, base ourselves in a sector which counts on the biggest physical network in the world and this network uh, is made up of human resources and for this reason we point out the importance of the rights of workers it's a fundamental factor in our sector in terms of a role regulator now we'd like to uh, mention as has been mentioned today and yesterday uh, we need to act as a facilitator so that all stakeholders can work and develop uh, under the same rules of play. Specifically speaking, we need to uh, ensure that the conditions in which services are applied uh, are correct and that quality uh, is applied correctly. We need to ensure compliance with objects and public policies and ensure human rights communications. As we mentioned before, in order to ensure this compliance with the objectives and public policies and human rights communications, there is a particular case in Argentina which we'd like to point out. This, we would say, is a new challenge. In December 2014, uh, there was a law which was a uh, adopted and this law is known as Argentina Digital and the aim is to incorporate within the regulatory uh, areas our regulation control monitoring and verification of the postal service and communications. Thus far we have uh, regulated telecommunications, postal services, satellite services and from now onwards we will also attend to ICTs. This law uh, has created a federal authority for technology and communications and this will report directly to the national executive and our new challenge is to uh, regulate and our aim is to harmonise the interests of the various stakeholders and to reflect the needs of citizens in the area of new technologies and innovation. Other challenges we face very briefly now, we've identified the following challenges and we share these with many of the countries here present. We need to adapt to control and regulatory tasks. As we mentioned before, this is an ongoing task and it needs to be based on needs uh, of the various uh, stakeholders and above all of users. There's the implementation of mechanisms for citizen participation in order to meet the uh, growing uh, requirements of users. Uh, as things stand, uh, requirements are, are qualitative rather than quantitative and uh, we speak a great deal about the importance of, uh, of uh, understanding and anticipating needs. We need to comply with what we uh, promise to provide. We need to uh, provide the service we say we're going to provide. It's also economic development with social inclusion. And we'd like to point out here a number of functions which are provided by a designated operator. They're not only traditional services that are provided by a DO, but there are also the distribution of smart codes of public transportation. There are loans managed by social security. Uh, there are links with citizens established at post offices and uh, various government services provided at post offices. I shouldn't neglect uh, the most important aspects uh, at this conference. We're at a UPU strategy conference here and at the international level we uh, see the UPU as a partner also in regulatory matters. We understand that cooperation with regard to development of postal reform is very important and uh, work conducted by restricted unions is important too. And in our region, we can say that we work in close cooperation with the uh, UPU and the PUAS. And 
we share a great deal with UPU and PUASP and it's very important uh, to exchange best practices and to organize forums, seminars and debates. And uh, this uh, is very important at events like this and future events we can deal with this and other topics and we can bring in all players uh, involved in the work of the Universal Postal Union with a view to developing the sector. This is, uh, in summary, uh, I've tried to be as brief as possible in what I've said. I had little time available, but this yeah. is what I wanted to share with you. And of course, we are available uh, to continue to work with the UPU and member countries, in particular in the area of regulation. And this will allow us to develop the sector as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Victoria Sukenik. Sorry, I have to. <laughs> okay. So I would like to go straight to the next speaker who is uh, a colleague from Tanzania. It's Professor John S. Nkoma. Professor John S. Nkoma is currently the Director General of the Tanzanian Communication Regulatory Authority. He is that since 2004. He is in the family of the regulators, a well-known personality, I may say. He's also regulating telecommunications, broadcasting, postal services, managing the radio frequency spectrum, I would say, how it should be, and all together. And uh, Professor Nkoma has over 25 years experience also in university teaching. He was uh, the, the head of department from 1997 to 81 in the University of Dar es Salaam and then well, joined the University of Botswana, where he served as the Dean of Faculty of Science and uh, he's a professor of physics. And so, not always lawyer, also physics could be important in regulation. John, you have the floor. Thanks very much. Um, to begin with, I'd like to thank the UPU for organizing the World uh, Strategy Conference and also Ivory Coast for uh, Cote d'Ivoire for chairing this particular meeting. My presentation will be in two parts. The first part will be talking about Africa in general. Um, wearing my hat as uh, a chair of the Administrative Council of the Pan-African Postal Union. And then later I'll shift to regulation within the TCRI. So to start with, uh, the, the Pan-African Postal Union is a specialized agency of the African Union. There are 44 member countries, and the vision of uh, of uh, of the Pan-African Postal Union is actually to be one postal network for Africa. But not just isolated as Africa, but also as a part of the global postal network. It has quite a, a number of noble objectives in its strategic plan. Uh, the first one is the establishment of adequate and efficient postal outlets and intra African mail transmission networks. The second objective is creation of the new ICT products and services and development of the postal financial services. I think in the last two days we've seen how important the financial services are. We've also seen how important the ICT products are. The third objective is to improve efficiency and capacity building at the PAP Secretariat. And I'm glad that the Secretary General of the PAP is actually here. Uh, objective number four is creation of a single postal territory in Africa. And then objective number five is the promotion of reforms of sustainable development of the post in the continent. And finally, objective number six is to promote responsible and positive contribution to the community and the environment. Now, PAPU has got quite a number of those uh, noble objectives, and actually last week in Bern, we had a very good meeting where we reviewed the performance of the African countries since the Doha Postal Strategy, and also preparing midway towards the next uh, strategy in Istanbul. Let me now shift my head to the regulation of uh, in Tanzania. First of all, uh, I should say that uh, TCRA is a convergent regulator, so it regulates telecommunications, broadcasting, 
and poster. There are a lot of discussions as to whether you should have one regulator or mark regulators. But I would like to say that within the experience of the Tanzania situation, I think there are a lot of synergies. For example, you, you have a director of postal regulation, a director of telecom regulation, a director of broadcasting regulation, but then you share the other services like the legal. You share all the legal issues, licensing issues. You also share the issue of consumer protection and, uh, and market study, tariff analysis. It doesn't matter whether you are, you are analyzing the tariffs for telecoms or for broadcasting for, for the poster. So I think those synergies are, are important. The regulation improves the postal sector governance by primarily ensuring proper operation of the designated postal operator, which in Tanzania is the Tanzania Post Corporation. The regulation landscape actually goes a long way since 1993. And then 94, there were separate regulators for telecoms, for posts, and for broadcasting. But in 2003, these were merged into a single regulatory body. The importance of policy is also important. There is the National Postal Policy of 2003, which outlined very clearly the, drop, the importance of competition, the importance of evolving the private sector, and then the importance of developing, developing a national address system, which in this case is the, the postcode. The legal, the laws, uh, we have uh, the, the Tanzania Communication Regulatory Authority Act, which is up to the regulator in 2003, and then we have the Electronic and Postal Communications Act of 2010. From these uh, laws, you have regulations, like you have the Consumer Protection Regulation of 2011, and this is, includes all the issues of telecoms, broadcasting, quality of service, and so on. Uh, the institutional arrangements between the government and the regulator and the operators are clearly defined. My minister is here, who actually heads the Ministry of Communication, Science, and Technology. Uh, let me say that the regulated services include the uniform, universal services, electronic services, and then courier services. There is quite a lot of competition in the courier, courier area where you have the, the international licenses like DHL, TNT, you have the national licenses, and then you have the East Africa licenses for between Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, Rwanda. And uh, let me conclude by saying that there are also quite a number of challenges. And these challenges include the management of the new uh, financial services in the, in, the, in, in the postal arena. Financial services have been, has been very successful, for example, money transfer by the mobile companies, and within Tanzania there's quite a lot of interoperability between one, net, one mobile operator and another. There's also um, cross-border uh, uh, money transfer, for example, between Tanzania and Kenya. You have the Safaricom in Kenya and Vodacom in Tanzania. You can pay across the, the border. You can also have uh, cross payments between Tanzania and Rwanda for what is known as Tigo Pesa. Now, all these, of course, have been, uh, have been facilitated by regulation. Uh, to conclude, I think the posts in the early years looked at ICTs as um, a threat. When they did a sort of analysis, that was a threat. But now it is clearly an opportunity. So I think the post sector has to integrate the, the, the uh, ICTs in its plans so that we see uh, applications like e-commerce, e-government, and all the electronic applications. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. For this uh, statement, Professor John Asen Koma, I just have a short question, and then we go to the to the uh, to our dear friend delegates. Where do you see? Be a bit self-critical. Where do you see a point where we could uh, bring down regulation? We have we all find, or some, this uh, the the operational side finds too much regulation, too much red tape, too many obstacles. Where in your field? in being self
critical, you think we could uh, bring down regulation, we could deregulate. I start with you. Where could we deregulate in Malaysia? Just, just one, one thing, you know, just a brief answer. We can regu uh, deregulate the uh, value-added service. That's, that's happening already. And uh, USO, we have to relax a bit. Okay. Lithuania, or probably for the whole European Union? For once, you can speak for the whole European Union. Uh, as for the Europe, actually, uh, the regime is very light, so the entering is already deregulated. The provision of the services is very uh, Could you speak liberal. up a bit? Uh, the provision of the services is very liberal already in the Europe. So as for the Lithuania, I think we, what we've done yesterday, I mean like uh, in the very short period for, uh, since, uh, since uh, some time, it's uh, we lightened the uh, universal service. Up to so the natural less persons. on the universal service less, obligation. Yes, forward to the natural persons on small enterprises. Thanks, Kenya. Uh, I think uh, what I have seen is that the, the more the more you, we innovate, the less we regulate, uh, because uh, most of the innovations uh, ride on um, the, uh, on services that are already regulated, and if now the innovations are many, um, you don't kind of regulate every other innovation. So most of the innovations uh, operate in, a, in, in, in an, an atmosphere which is not very much regulated. So the more we innovate, the less we start getting into uh, regulation. And we've seen it even um, in... So in when you fly back to Nairobi, where will you deregulate? You go so, back and say, I've been in Geneva, you want to deregulate <laughs> one point. Where? where do you see a possibility? We, we need to encourage more, more innovation because as, 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 as people innovate more, mm -hmm. They, they get into the realm that uh, does not need a lot of restriction. And that is really when you start allowing them to do uh, what they ought to do as long as uh, it is not inhibiting other people to play. Okay, Argentina, where would you deregulate? De yes, in my opinion, yesterday one of the speakers in the first panel said that we needed increased regulation. And we uh, believe that we shouldn't speak about more or less about regulation. Regulation is needed and countries need to know their own reality and regulate based on reality and the specific situation in their country. But we can't speak about more or less regulation. That's not in order. So you would say better regulation but not less regulation. John? Well, you don't regulate if the market is working. For example, a good example is the interconnection rates. I mean, you, you allow the market to regulate itself. But if there's a market failure, then, of course, you intervene. Uh, in the financial services, for example, we've seen interoperability is not something which the regulator forced. But I think the market itself, people realize that if you have your, your subscriber locked to one mobile operator, it's not good. So you don't regulate if the market is working. Okay. So that's clearly, if it's not really necessary to regulate, it is necessary not to regulate, as I understand. I, have, uh, I would like to open it now to the, to the floor, to, the, to you, dear delegates. I have an intervention already from Cuba. Cuba, you have the floor. Thank you. Brief. After one minute, I'll intervene. Thank you. Thank you. Give me the floor. In Cuba, we are working on the regulatory framework and regulatory policy, bearing in mind uh, the topic of flexibility above all, and postal reform. We understand that we need to diversify uh, services. You're all familiar with this uh, subject. We are dealing with these topics too in Cuba and the new trend of postal services, the universal service and electronic services too, we're bearing all this in mind as well as increasing flexibility. Now, I would like to ask uh, our Malaysian uh, speaker to talk more about one topic uh, about rural communities. Uh, how have you borne rural communities in mind in the regulatory uh, issues in your country? 
particular in terms of providing service in rural areas. In Cuba too, it's an area of concern for us. Thank you. Thank you, Cuba. Most side Abdul Karim, could you answer? Regulating the uh, universal service, especially in, uh, in rural areas, is, is a challenging matter, not only in Malaysia, I think in Cuba, as well as worldwide. But as letter post is declining, which letter post used to be the main finance of the universal service system in the last decade, for example. So the overall model is, is changing. So what we have done in Malaysia is how to make sure that our universal service is not burdensome. So one way of doing it in Malaysia, in particular that what we're trying to do is to ask the designated operator themselves to define what is rural service and the service standard that you're going to offer rather than the regulator who impose on you. But of course there will be some safeguarding uh, measures uh, to protect the consumer. I have a question. Isn't mobile communication, you know, mobile handsets and so on, SMSs, replacing a lot of communication which was meant to be before in mail, uh, postal mail, and that almost replaces a bit the universal service? It's a very interesting questions. I think this is Many countries are, are looking into how you can have a converged universal service, for example, in telecoms and posts. But I haven't seen any one in the world has done that. Even in Malaysia, we still have a separate universal service for telecoms and for the posts. And I think in the next few years, maybe in the next decade, you never know there will be a converged USO. Yeah. We will discuss this in the next panel, of course, mais j'ai encore une intervention. Once again, France uh, wants to speak. Uh, France, you have a floor, but please be brief in your intervention. Thank you. You have a floor, France. Thank you. I'm Jean-Paul Forceville. I'm responsible for regulation for the Post Group in France. I uh, heard the various interventions and in my understanding, the regulator today needs to be very aware of the universal service and how it's financed. Uh, the clearing funds, of course, don't, uh, or compensation funds don't uh, function properly. Uh, nat national budgets uh, are limited and we need to reflect uh, on actual demand and to understand what the level of the universal service is today and uh, what can be tolerated at a level of universal service. We need to ensure that the universal service uh, 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 responds to the drop in volumes. In terms of extending regulation to other sectors, I believe that things begin with parcels uh, uh, and financial services. Uh, we talk about new technologies in these areas too. There are regulators, of course, in these markets, the financial services. And in any case, there are the competition authorities, which one day may become the only regulators in the postal markets. And finally, I would like to draw your attention to the fact uh, that we need to uh, think about uh, protecting postal operators <coughs> from other operators which don't comply with the same rules of the game in terms of taxation and social measures. Thank you, France, for your intervention. Of course, the final comment uh, is a very important one, and unfortunately we can't discuss that at this point. If the rules are the same for posts uh, and uh, for new players uh, such as Alibaba, such as Amazon, and of course there's a big question opened up there. We might be able to discuss that this afternoon, but we have a lack of time, time's limited, and uh, the question of financing the universal service, we will discuss that during the next panel. So at this stage, due to time constraints, I need to conclude this panel. I'd like to thank all the panellists. I'd like to thank uh, the four panellists who have just spoken. 
That's to say, Mr. Karim from Malaysia, Mrs. Raniene from Lithuania, Mrs. Sukinik from Argentina, uh, and uh, our uh, speaker from Kenya, and Mr. Nakoma from uh, Tanzania. I'd like to thank all of you for your various interventions and for your contributions. And I would ask the speakers uh, of the next panel, panel six, to come to join us uh, immediately on the podium. That's to say, Mr. Tolstein Olsen, Mr. Jacques Hamand, Mr. Yunis Gibrin, and Mr. Gebri Mikel. So many thanks. Uh, we will continue in two or three minutes' time. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm? Very short panel, not so much. Yes, I know, I know, I know. No, that's a problem. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Good to see you again. We've seen each other in Nairobi. That was great. I had yes, yes. such a good memory of it. Thanks yes, again. Yes, and give my uh, greetings to your colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, that was great. Uh, yes. Is it? Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you very much, John. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maître, ça. Oui, oui, je suis le modérateur. Oui, oui, merci. Parce que je n'ai pas le temps de, de le chercher. So. Sorry, I'm fighting a bit with the time, but I think it should be all right. I mean, I go a little bit one to one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly. Bonjour, monsieur. Salut, Jack. Tolstein, hello. How are you this morning? So, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, we go on to the panel number six, the last panel this morning. Thanks for your enthusiasm to stick uh, to the end of this morning. Lunch is not waiting yet, so we are looking forward to the next panel. The next panel, uh, we 
this has, we also have regulators on the panel, but not only regulators, we have uh, representatives of, of, uh, of, uh, of the Postal uh, Pan-African Union and of course also of, uh, of, a, of a government. So it is quite a versatile um, panel. Of course this morning it's more about governments, more about regulators, less with the postal firms that we had very much yesterday and we'll have it again this afternoon. The discussion this morning, uh, this panel is about universal service, serving member countries, businesses and citizens through the universal service. Universal service was already mentioned obviously this morning. We can't regulate, we can't have a policy, a government policy without respecting the universal service because I think everybody agrees liberalization is great, opening markets is great, doing business is great, but it can't be only grabby for the people in the, in the privileged areas, in the towns, in the privileged parts of the towns. Universal service has to deal, has to serve also those in rural areas, the poorer people and so on. Universal service is a demand of uh, humanity, I would say, be it in postal service, financial services, telecoms, medical services very much. So this is an important topic. It's a topic for regulators, of course, for governments, because the regulators, they have to implement the rules of, a, of a universal service. The governments have to um, say what are the roles, have to do the definition of this universal service, that's not the same every, in every uh, country, and the designators, op operators who have usually the license of the universal service, who have the obligation to do the universal service, they are of course the ones who have to do then the service to the citizen. The, the definition of the universal service is different in every country, and that's good like that. That's concerning the needs of the population and also concerning the national conditions. For example, in the European Union, it's very difficult, difficult to do a definition for the universal service in the postal area because the situation in Greece or in Latvia is different than it's in Germany or in Spain. And the uh, universal service definition has to be a bit different from country to country. But some common rules, but there are some common rules for the universal service, be it financing, but be it or being also in implementing. I hope we can also discuss uh, which role the integrators have, the Ebays, the Amazons, the Alibabas of this world, because they, of course, can pick their cherries. They don't have any obligations, but shouldn't they contribute to the financing, for example, of the universal service? Because it was just mentioned by the French colleague, you know, what about financing the universal service? In many countries, this is a problem. Um, and uh, we have to face this problem because if you can't finance it anymore, it is uh, useless to talk about universal service. This is a difference to the telecom sector where universal service usually is easily uh, covered, the cost covered by the market, not the case in necessarily in the postal markets. So I would also like in this panel to put a special uh, focus on the emerging countries because we have a national um, so a universal service, but we also have an international uh, universal service. The universal service or the post situation of the postal services in less developed countries is completely different than here in Geneva or in Paris or in, uh, in New York. And I think we as a UPU family have to really also go into this discussion. New ways, also their innovative ways, uh, could be the, the way more using mo modern technologies like mobile payment, mobile telecommunication to deliver uh, the needs of the people in rural areas in, for example, in Africa, in South America and so on. So those are the topics we tackle uh, this morning and it's a, it's a pleasure to have uh, my colleagues here. I start with uh, the colleagues are Thorstein Olsen, the Director General of the Norwegian Post and Telecommunication Authority, Jack Hammond, the Chairman of the Belgium uh, Regulator, 
We have Yunus Tiprin, the Secretary General of the Pan-African Postal Union, and we have uh, the honor to have the Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Communication and Information Technology of Ethiopia, the Honorable uh, Dr. Tibretian Gabri Michael here. Welcome, gentlemen, uh, to, this, uh, to this panel. And I give the floor first to Thorstein Olsen. Thorstein Olsen is since uh, four years Director General of the Norwegian Post and Telecommunication Authority. He is, uh, since the beginning of this authority there, he's built, he has built it up. He has a very active role, not only in Norway, but also in the European, um, uh, in the European group of regulators, of the telecom regulators of the BEREC. He was two years ago vice president of BEREC, and so he, he uh, has, of course, a uh, big knowledge of regulation in general, but the postal sector also belongs to this authority. So we'll be interested to have your short presentation. Thorstein, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you to uh, UPU for inviting me here. I'm very glad I got this chance to talk to UPU also. I haven't done that before, so this is uh, a great pleasure for me to do this. And um, I will start with my conclusion. I will conclude that we need to find a new definition of postal services and that um, mail is not anymore the most important way of communications. So I'll uh, uh, show you why. And this is happening on all countries, in a different phase though, but uh, it's happening. In Norway, uh, as many others have said today, the declining volumes of letters are uh, increasing, and the increasing volumes of parcels uh, are there, and it seems quite balanced. Uh, we have 22% um, less letters since uh, 2005, and 21% more parcels since 2005. So it's pretty balanced. But you have to remember that we are talking about billions of letters and only millions of parcels. So it is not balanced. And this is crucial to all postal operators throughout the world. Uh, in Norway, Norway Post is the main op operator. They are represented here, so I have to be very... Um, uh, uh, I have to behave myself, not uh, talking badly about Norway Post. They are a good company. So is our ministry. They are also here, so I have to behave. But uh, our government, uh, as the one of the last countries in Europe, they have finally decided to propose to liberalize the postal market in Norway. And uh, this proposal will be put forward for the um, parliament, uh, hopefully before the summer. So at the end of this year, we will probably have a liberalized postal market, also in Norway. But as you see, the letters are uh, declining, the number of letters are declining, so there won't be much new things to compete on. On parcels, there is full competition already. This is uh, the estimated development of the number of letters for the next years to come. So it's uh, billions of letters are uh, uh, Diminishing, they are, uh, they are uh, gone, and there are other ways of communicating. Because people are still in need to communicate, but there are new means of communications. And we are facing this uh, severely in, in Norway, and we have a digital population. We call it a digital population because more now the figures are from last year, more than 80% of the households have access to internet. And one third of the households have actually internet connections with more than 32 megabits per second. And almost three fourths of the population, not the households, but 75% uh, of the population have smartphones, so they are communicating via smartphones instead of letters. And they are communicating more and more via the, the smartphones and via the internet. Uh, actually, 90% of the population use internet banking, so the bank uh, uh, branches are closing down also. 
And um, since uh, two years ago, uh, the majority of the population is actually reading the newspaper digitally and not in paper anymore, which is a tremendous uh, challenge to the, um, to the newspapers and the news houses. And as of next year, our government have decided that all communications from the public sector to the, to the inhabitants and the citizens of Norway will be done by email. This is uh, very severe for Norway Post and others that are conveying a mail, but we have to adapt to this. And this shows that mail is not important as a means of communications and anymore. But mail, and especially parcels, is still very, very important. The implications we see from this is that we need a new and clear definition of postal services. I will come back to that and, and ask the UPU to, to start looking into a clearer and better definition of postal services. But we still need a minimum level of universal services, uh, especially when it comes to parcels. Uh, there we need, in, in all the countries of the world, we need an efficient network for distributing physical items. The electronic communications have come to stay and people will uh, switch to electronic communications for the normal communications. But we need better and more secure uh, physical networks to convey parcels and physical items. And as we see, we have seen yesterday and we see today that there are huge differences between the different countries in the world, but there are also differences within a country or within, especially within Europe. It's a huge difference and that is a challenge because the, the needs in the different countries are very different. Between the north and the south of Europe, it's a huge difference. And we need also to start a new discussion on the right to communicate, because that is what we are trying to regulate, not the letters as such. The government of the world need to ensure the right of the citizens to communicate, whether this is by mail or by electronic means, the right to communicate is what we are striving to achieve. And we have to start this discussion in a new way. We have to look into the universal service obligation within the telecom sector and within the postal sector. Because the way we communicate changes and the universal service obligations within these two sectors have to melt and we have to, have to regard them together. Uh, but to, to enable us to do that, we have to start, we can start with the postal sector and we need a clear definition of what is post. In many countries, we don't need post anymore to, uh, to communicate, but we need post to ensure the fiscal uh, conveyance of, of uh, items. And um, we, I would like to start with this. The yellow uh, circle is uh, what somebody called the postal services. It includes conveyance of all physical items, whether they are addressed or not. Uh, it's included in the yellow circle. And a part of this yellow circle is the universal service of obligation uh, that should depend on national needs. Within this yellow circle, this is a white circle that is the registered and unregistered addressed mail. That is smaller than the, the postal service as such, as many define it. But we are talking also about the basic postal services. And what is that? It's not registered and unregistered uh, addressed items as such. Because in this circles, uh, we have not put in any um, limitations when it comes to kilos, for example. And that is the main lack of the definitions we find throughout the world today. It's, it's a definition of universal service obligation. It's not a definition of postal services as such. And I, when I was leading a, a working group within SERP many years ago, um, we were trying to define what is the, the, the real postal services. What is the, what is the 
the source, uh, actually. And the funny thing is that everybody knows what post is until they are asked to define it. And it's like time. Everybody knows what time is until you have to define it. Then it's almost impossible. So that's why we are striving with this definition. And the, the core element of postal services is actually the red uh, circle. It's unregistered addressed items. That is the unique thing that postal operators throughout the world does. Registered mail can be passes or, uh, or ordinary registered letters, but they are all registered and they are based on an individual agreement between the, the operator and the sender. But the core thing that nobody else is dealing with is actually the red circle, unregistered addressed items. When you need a postal operator as a third party that you trust. And the trusting thing is the very, very special thing for postal operators throughout the world. And still, there are only the designated postal operators that is dealing with this red circle, unregistered addressed items. And I think we have to start with defining more clearly what is postal services, and then we have to start a discussion how to ensure universal uh, uh, communication services, including the electronic services. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thorstein Olsen. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, views and uh, food for thought about uh, universal service. And I give uh, uh, the floor to another colleague of mine, Jack Hammond. He is the chairman of the Council of the Belgium Institute for Postal Services and Telecommunication. Jack joined the BIPT, the Belgium regulator, in 2013. And uh, before, he has quite an interesting uh, curriculum vitae. He worked for Disney Corporation and for Ver Verizon Business. He was in Cisco, so he comes from the private sector. And uh, then he changed uh, to uh, joined the public sector as Director General for Personal and Organization Development at the FPS Personal and Organization. He is by, um, by profession, uh, has a Master in Organizational Psychology and has an additional degree in management and is now, uh, the, as I said, the Chairman of the Belgium Regulator, who is also regulating telecom and postal services together. And he was last year Vice President of BEREC. Jack, you have the floor. Thank you, Mark. If I may, first of all, I would like to thank Côte d'Ivoire as the host country, and of course I would like to thank the Director General and the Vice Director General of the UPU for uh, organising this conference. I know that I have a challenge because we have the lunch afterwards. Then I have two questions for you. Please answer quickly. First of it, did you get a parcel home within the last three months? Show me your hand. Last three months. Okay, thank you. And did you send a personal mail or postcards within the last six months? Six months. Okay, there's still work to do. You know, when I was uh, a young boy, I enjoyed a lot the postman, of course, because I was getting a nice presents from my grandmother, but also because when you think about postman, you think about every time, all the weather, uh, is it a letter? Is it a parcel? They are just coming to your home to deliver it. It is incredible and for a long time. But I have to, sorry about that, Mark, to talk about my holidays. Right. Because I was on leave last week and I don't know about you, but when I'm traveling, the first thing I need to do is to find some post office and to find posts and mailboxes. And it's so attractive and, in, you know, Interesting for me that whenever you go, you will find in the middle of nowhere mailboxes. This is just incredible that you are a small company, you are in a small farm, far away, you will get your letters, you will get your parcels. But as you know, we, we told that already for the last two days, there are changes in the postal environment. We see 
a fantastic growth of the parcels. And in the panel six, of course, we have to address that because all PMEs, SMEs, small, medium business enterprise, they need, of course, postal services to be successful in the e-commerce. And we see the transformation. The transformation based on four pillars. First of all, drive for changes are based on new kind of competition. Secondly, new kind of demands from companies and citizens. Last but not least, collaboration trends between market players. And of course, a number of changes, like Thorsten said, between economical situation, social situation, and technology evolution. But of course, what we see, and I don't want to discuss too much about that, very exciting products emerging. For example, postal e-services. But we see also some changes in behaviors, like community mail, and we see also that in the transformation of postal players, they change the way they are delivering all mail and parcels. For example, in boxes, home, or in pickup points. And we can even dream to get your lunch later on delivered here uh, by post companies. At ERGP, we knew that it was the right time to think about what will be the USO in the future based on the existing European uh, Postal Directive. And then we first had to look on what's going on in Europe, of course, and what we see is that there are different trends, like Thorsten said. We don't have one single model fits all. We have changes, enlargement, coverage, uh, reduction, um, different trends and that we need to understand. But also in the world, we have in Canada, New Zealand or in the US, different ways to think about uh, postal services coverage and universal service obligations. Then we continue the exercise IGRGP with our consultation and stakeholders meeting. First of all, we see that when we look about quality of service, we see about number of postal access points or registered mail, we have difference within Europe uh, member states. And then we decided to go through five questions. First of all, what could be the common minimum scope of USO, including essential elements that should be guaranteed? Secondly, who will finance that and how? Do we need to define a USP provider? What will be the relationship and impact on USO and competition effects? And last but not least, thinking about professional or private users, we have, of course, to think which user category should be targeted by the USO. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if we have to talk about evolution or we have to talk about revolution. If we look to the first preliminary bottom-up feedback we got from all the players and uh, uh, governments, ministries, attending to a stakeholders meeting a few months ago, what we can see about US definition is one, we have to discuss about reduction or at least review the scope. Secondly, we need to introduce more flexibility. Three, we have to consider potentially some specific user groups and needs. Regarding designation, we have to rethink about the way we will designate some USP providers. Public auctions, tendering, a lot of questions. Do we have to do that? Question mark. About financing, different way to do it, self-financing, public financing, or even compensation fund. We still have to discuss that further. About competition, also leveraging what will be the impact on the current competition and the future of it. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, is the time to go to the next level. I invite the whole audience to help ARGP and UPU to rethink about the future of USO because it's the time now to think about the future. And I'm dreaming about a time in the world when I will order something from another country, from a small companies, and getting delivered to my home, independently when I'm living in the middle of nowhere, like I call it, and I hope that Belgium is not in the middle of nowhere. But I really would like to invite all the members to a call to action to think about that. I invite also you to have a look um, at the end of 2015 about our report. And I would like to say thank you very much for the future. Thank you. Merci, Jacques.
Thank you, Jack Hamant, for this uh, presentation. And uh, I go immediately to the next one, Mr. Yunus Jibrin, his Secretary General from the Pan -Afri African um, Postal Union. Mr. Uh, Yunus Jibrin uh, is uh, the uh, was Inspector or General of Cameroon's Ministry of Post and Telecommunication, Chairman of the Anti-Corruption Unit of Post and Telecommunications and ICT sectors in uh, Cameroon. He brings a lot of uh, postal experience. I think you are since 30 years, I didn't think you were that old, but think 30 years uh, experience in postal development in Cameroon and in other countries. He's also, he was a, also representative of Cameroon to the Council of Administration of the UPU, so he knows UPU very well, when he served there as a chairman of the Technical Cooperation and Postal Reform Project Group in UPU. But now you present, represent the Pan-African Postal Union, PAPU, that's also where we met in Grand Bassam in Ivory Coast uh, recently. You have the floor, uh, Yunus Jibrin. Merci. Thank you, moderator. And uh, my thanks above all to Côte d'Ivoire, which uh, is hosting the conference at the CICG in Geneva. And I'd also like to thank the Director General of the UPU, the th Swiss authorities that have um, enabled this um, meeting hosted by Africa to take place. Now, before uh, beginning my brief presentation, I wish to point out I've just noticed that we have a, a convergence of views with the UPU in regarding the contribution of innovative, inclusive solutions. The African Union, uh, for his 2063 vision, has an objective which is a prosperous united Africa through inclusive growth based on sustainable development and PAPU last week organized a conference on its vision for 2020 with um, post 2020 Africa at the forefront for developing inclusive solutions to satisfy the needs of clients and all parties as part and therefore um, inclusion really comes across strongly through all of these institutions now very briefly um, I have little time but uh, for detail, but you see the aspirations of the 2063 agenda of the Africa that we want, which you see now displayed on the screen. Um, a glimpse of the um, PAPU, which was established uh, as a governmental body, a specialist um, body of the African unit. A few indicators which are appearing on the stay on the screen they speak for themselves and could the speaker is asking for his laptop I thought I could read the screen but I'm afraid I can't read at that distance well yes if we need the uh, electronic means of communication at the post. Yes, so as I was saying, uh, um, we, we have th uh, therefore 76% of adults um, who do not have a bank account, over 20% of post offices in Africa do not have electricity and are even less c connectivity and over 12%, almost 20% of the population does not have access at all to postal services, which um, in terms of the Pan-African Postal Union uh, provides us with this strat strategic vision for promoting visions in order to develop the postal services uh, in Africa in all member countries and to encourage cooperation between these stakeholders 
in now to, for the, in order to save time i won't give you go into all the details you see on the, the in the tables but you'll have this in the documents that will be circulated now what I wish to emphasize are the challenges that we face concerning the very rapid development of the market and the acceleration of technological in innovation. Clients are becoming increasingly demanding in terms of the quality of service. We have a drastic decline in um, mail volume with um, reduced profits and um, an exhaustion of the investment reserves. And the organization of the service, postal service, is constantly evolving. We have requirements for the offering of postal services that have to be simple, affordable, and accessible. And in Africa, um, <clears throat> contrary to the diagram that was showed by a previous speaker in Africa, this demand is growing uh, at an increasingly fast pace and the sustained development of a postal market is increasingly open to uh, the competition. Therefore, how can we prepare tomorrow's universal postal service? We must therefore define a universal postal service that is appropriate for the needs of our time and that is appropriate in order to take into account the developments. And we are talking about a dichotomy in development given the development of new technologies. Now I'm talking about dichotomy but there is no antinomy because technology is a neutral factor, it depends on us and it's up to us to use it appropriately because even criminals use it when they um, see fit. Therefore, we have four um, criteria. Number one, improving the quality of service. Dive, two, diversifying the services, physical, financial and electronic services. Three, improving infrastructure. And number four, postal regulation, which are the main thrusts with the improvement of the service for uh, both domestic and international um, mail services, postal services, and also um, financial digital inclusion, because the theme of financial inclusion has become a major theme for our organization. Um, the African Union, which is seeking uh, integrated development by 2063, as I said earlier, when it will celebrate its centenary anniversary. The improvement of infrastructure and is the most uh, significant aspect because the weaknesses, the breaks on development in Africa um, uh, are derived from the inadequate infrastructure and the lack of an addressing system and the uh, obsolete nature of the means of communication which at African Union's level has led to the key priority um, being the strong cooperation with the UPU and the PAPU in order... Well, first of all, we didn't want to put the cart before the horse because connectivity and the inclusion that we see for African citizens wherever they may be, um, whatever their, the size of their wallet may be, requires a basic infrastructure in terms of connectivity Activity, which itself depends on the availability of um, uh, electricity, of a power grid when it is needed, and therefore this has become a flagship project which will give ride um, at the headquarters of the African Union in August uh, of a conference for the international lenders a conference which will enable financing and to enable all Africans to be connected and to be citizens of the, of the world. And also the addressing system, which is also a factor. It's part of our identity. Somebody who does not have an address does not simply does not exist. And this is a project, uh, this is a phenomenon that requires us to um, uh, respond in order for mail to be delivered to the remotest parts of Africa. Now, of course, this has to be backed up by regulation. We are considering this. Um, 
Africa needs regulation because the economic reforms that have been undertaken based on what at the time seemed to be our development pi partners led to an almost total disaster that left by the roadside many of our fellow citizens and for our objective of 2063 these uh, aspects have to be settled and we need regulation to uh, put order in this market and the Universal Postal Service has to have a sustained financing, hence the need to create special funds for the financing and the adoption of an appropriate postal uh, directive and, and a national directive based on a continental directive that we are in the process of drawing up um, with the Pan-African Parliament. So, moderator and dear colleagues, that is uh, in a nutshell what I wanted to say with this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. General de la... Eunice Dubrin, the Secretary General of the Pan African Postal Union. He is the Secretary General of this important organisation, and I would like to thank you warmly for those comments, and we will discuss this afterwards. And I now give the floor to Dr. De Bretzion Jebri Michael. Uh, Dr. Jebri Michael of Communication and Information Technology of the Democratic Federal Republic of Ethiopia. He's also chairman of this PAPU of the Plenipotentiary Conference of the Pan-African uh, Conference on the Post of the Postal Union. Uh, Dr. De Bretzion Gebre Michael is Deputy Prime Minister for Finance and the Economic Cluster and the Minister of Communication and Information Technology of Ethiopia. And uh, he is also currently the chairman of the board of Ethiopian Electric Power Corporation. He was previously director general of the Ethiopian Information and Communication Technology. So his uh, whole professional life he put into building up technology infrastructure in his country. And I welcome you warmly here. He's by profession engineer which usually helps understanding technical, uh, the technical uh, developments in a country, not like me as a lawyer, who usually does not understand that really in depth. So you have the floor. Thank you, moderator. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to thank the organizers, UPU, Cote d'Ivoire, and other partners for organizing this event and uh, inviting us to be part of the event. Well, uh, I think this is not the right time for me to make a speech uh, regarding these postal services, but uh, I would, in the interest of time, I would be very short. Before I proceed to the topic uh, that has been already introduced by the moderator, I would like to talk one story that I have uh, come across the postal service. Yeah, well, it's a long time back while I was a student. You know, in Ethiopia we had a revolution. The, the current party in power is the one that led the revolution. So one day I was assigned to send a letter to officials by the revolutionaries. Since the revolution by then is illegal, I just cannot communicate the officials directly because I will be put in jail. So what I have to do is, I have to go through the post office. I cannot, uh, I, have not, I should not register my name, but it's an ordinary mail. So mail has done the service for me. And it was uh, quite uninteresting. There were a lot of messages from the, re the revolutionaries to the then governors to let them know that they have to cool down. They have to, have to take care of our people. They have to be as much as possible uh, moderate until the time comes. So this is one of my best memories of post when I was in travel, when I was assigned by the revolutionaries to, to hand over, but I cannot do that because I will be caught. So I have that uh, good memory. And today I'm uh, the head of this, uh, well, I'm not the director, but uh, as a minister, I'm heading this postal service. So I know the benefits during bad time. Now I, I will, move to the, 
the main topic, the challenge of the universal services and the solutions. They have, they have been, many speakers have discussed about it since yesterday, but I just want to briefly say uh, some few words and some few ideas on what we do with Ethiopia, and of course it also covers uh, the region. There are four challenges that I have tried to identify, but uh, I'm sure you will agree with them, with me as well. And uh, I will highlight what we are doing to address those challenges regarding this universal service. One of the challenges that has been, been discussed time and again is, uh, of course, the postal volumes is declining, also in our case. So to address that, we have embarked this e-commerce uh, initiative in our country. We are just beginning in this, uh, on this track. So the government has issued strategies and many other directives to, to expedite e-commerce and uh, postal service will be uh, instrumental in transforming the digital to the physical one. You cannot complete the whole process by e-commerce. E-commerce, you can do all the activities, but the physical handover must be done by some agent. And that agent, I'm sure you agree, is a postal service. In this regard, I also heard yesterday a good experience uh, from Saudi Post. They have, uh, they, they have an agreement with Amazon. So they have to bridge the communication, the digital with the physical, and that's an excellent uh, experience. We all have to emulate, and uh, we also like the experience that we heard. The, the second thing that we have to do in our case is to serve the underserved population. So in the rural community, we have around 80% of the country is rural, and they have, don't have access to, to posts. So now we have already embarked a project. At, currently, it's a, a model project to link post office to the rural communities as well. At the moment, almost 95% of the rural communities have a telecom service. We have already telecenters. We have added a new list of services to the centers. It is IT, electronic services. The third service coming is postal services. So now we, have tran we are transforming the telecom centers at the villages to communication centers. They can provide services of uh, telecom, IT, and post. And regarding cost, there is not much to, uh, to do from the postal service because it's already there. The, the establishment is already there. We are adding just services. So people will be served, and postal service will also get a revenue. On top of it, they are uh, supporting the development of the country. This is a new initiative. At the moment, it is uh, the model kind of intervention. By next year, we are going to scale up to cover all the villages. The other that has been raised time and again is uh, increase of parcel. I think this is also the case in Ethiopia, and we are working on it. The other challenge, and this is the, the, the communication behavior has changed of the citizens. People are using Facebook, emails, and many others. So uh, the later service is declining, obviously. Now, to the satisfaction of the customer, we have to use IT again to attract and retain customers. So with the use of uh, this tracking mechanism and then tracing these uh, services, the quality of service is changing. Before that, the quality of service from the sender point of view was hidden. The sender doesn't know the quality of service as the recipient did. Currently, because of this tracking mechanism, we have applied it and we are using and tracking it from any corner, whether it's from Geneva, whether it is in local, whether it is from US. The sender can track. So quality of service is increasing and this will help us retain and attract, as I said, uh, others. To, to improve sustainability in terms of in, uh, the perspective of finance, diversification of uh, business is one of the strategies that we are following. And uh, our postal services are doing non-postal services like finance, like payment, insurance. So many others are coming in the list. And uh, 
utility billing is also being handled and taken care of uh, this uh, by post, and this will help again in generating more revenue. There's diversifying the delivery channels is another intervention that we are trying, outsourcing some of the businesses to the third party. This mobile po post is also another intervention that we are trying to address, so this will help us in again um, maintaining sustainability. Use of IT, actually IT is a common denominator in all uh, scores, but we are using also IT to improve the, trans the transaction costs between the sender and uh, recipient, and as well to modernize the logistics and security. So this will help us sustain. The other challenge from our perspective, and it can also embrace others, is uh, limited professionals. So to improve the, the professional, professionalism within the sector, we are, we are linking this with the universities, with postal union, and there are trainings, opportunities that we have already benefited out of it. With uh, the support of EOPU and uh, PAPU, we are gaining. And there are a lot to do by PAPU in modernizing the postal service as well. So business process engineering and technology and application are being developed by some experts and are being shared by Papu. And Papu has a lot to play in our region, including Ethiopia, and we are gaining out of it. So uh, I think I just want to end by appreciating the role played by Papu as well. And uh, personally, I also want to appreciate uh, the Director General Ambassador for your support to UTP as well as to other the Postal Union. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, I also thank all of you for giving the time and as well as the patience during this lunch time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the Right Honourable Dr. De Bretzian Gibri Merkel, Vice Prime Minister, Minister of Communication and Information Technology from Ethiopia. Just a short question to the panel and then I will open uh, the discussion. We don't have that much time anymore. Financing. We all talked, wishing list of the USO, how you wish universal service obligation should be. How, in one or two sentences, how do you see the financing of it? Should that be the government? Should that be the sector? Should it uh, be another mean? How do you see that, Thorstein? Uh, that is one of the main reasons why we have to look uh, more carefully into uh, universal service obligations because it's becoming costly for something that people doesn't want to the same degree anymore. Uh, People are using electronic communications while the states have to pay so far for um, uh, a, a traditional uh, way of looking into universal service obligation. But the easiest way to do this is uh, pay by the state. Pay by the states, Chuck? Um, I th want to? Do you yes, want please. Okay. That's, then, that was the signal for you. Okay, then uh, just quickly, we have three options open. Uh, I think that uh, when we did our study at RGP, uh, compensation fund, benefits, and of course, of course some threats, we have uh, public financing, and we have, uh, of course, self-financing. Um, it's too early to define what and how, because we need firstly to review what will be exactly the USO scope. Then, sorry, Mark, I cannot give you the final answer about so it. So you don't think in, for example, in industrialized countries that it could be self-financed? It can by be. the gains of the, of it, the designated it, it, post. It can be, but you know, we definitely need to review the scope and based on that we have to, to, to decide which is the best way. But self-financing is one of them, yeah. of course. Okay. Uh, Mr. Yunus Jibrin, comment vous voyez les choses, comment on fait le... How do you see things regarding financing? Well, in order to seek financing f funds, first of all you have to establish who benefits from this. We're talking about the Universal Postal Services, which is for the benefit of ci citizens, for the ordinary citizens. And serving the ordinary citizen is the duty of any responsible government. Of course, 
it is down to governments, depending on their um, economic and social conditions, to come up with the appropriate uh, mechanism. This does not mean that it's necessarily the public coffer, but the government has to come up with the appropriate mechanism, depending on the actors we are talking about regarding these funds. And funding options vary, even in Africa. Um, often it is the operators, because the public operator is the only one who has the duty to cover the last mile, whereas the other operators who are seeking to run their own business in a restricted uh, uh, scope have to pay a fee. Now, um, in, in order to establish the uh, infrastructure and to provide the service, there are still in some countries there's still a form of reserved service in some countries which uh, enables the funding to be provided. And the third category concerns countries which, at the level, at level of the state, um, pay a contribution for funding the universal service, which, again, is the duty of the government and the operator is the, is the designated entity for uh, fulfilling the mission. Primarily, I would say the postal office has to diversify its products and services so that they can finance uh, their obligations. But the second one is, uh, as long as there is market inefficiency, the government can come to support some financing or uh, expenses as well. Okay, thank you very much. I think that gave about a whole possibilities and of course uh, uh, this is matter of discussion it also it's matter of how much we want to extend the universal service obligation the much the more we extend it the more expensive it is and the more we need uh, funding for it so that's of course uh, but that's a very political uh, question now I would like to open the floor to the to the plenary who has a remark I have time for about uh, two remarks or questions, even better, and please be, be short. Yes, that's, um, I can't see. Uh, Nigeria. Yeah, yeah, and, and the one to the left is, what's? Okay. Nigeria. It's the same thing, okay. No, it's just one. It's okay, Nigeria. Sorry, I, I saw two panels of Nigeria. So. Okay. <laughs> Nigeria East and Nigeria West. Okay, you have the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. My question actually is uh, on the definition of postal services. Uh, one of the panelists has raised an issue of need to redefine or def defy a clear definition of what postal services means. Uh, I, I, I think that um, being that the post office works on a three-dimensional uh, basis, both um, physical, financial, and digital. Uh, and these definitions were there uh, um, in the beginning. What should the UPU now consider as definition of, um, of postal services? Because I hear most often um, when they say uh, postal services and digital services or postal services and, uh, and, and financial services. Are they not now part of the post office? Thank you. That Thorstein Olsen said how impossible it is to give a definition of what the universal service or what the postal service is yeah. in general is. Is it possible to, to, to do a definition on postal services or is it not any more possible because we have so much convergence with other, uh, other uh, elements like telecommunication, like financial services? And that's, of course, important also for the definition of the universal service obligation. So is it possible to give a definition of the universal service? Uh, I start now with a colleague from Ethiopia. How do you see that? How would you do the definition? I don't expect you a clear definition in five words, but still, how do you see that? Yeah, well, uh, after all, we have tried to define uh, universal services in our case. Uh, in terms of, say, parcels, we say it should be less than two, ki two, two, two kilograms. Mm -hmm. And uh, later, just later. Uh, so, uh, and of course, the timeline, quality of service has to be also very clear. Mm -hmm. 
and we have, uh, I don't know exactly remember, but I think it, we said it should be within a week. There should be, this uh, letter has to be addressed to the destination within the country. So these are some of the items that we have identified in the, or defined in our universal service. In terms of distance, we said around five kilometers. So quite a clear, um, clear definition on criteria of quality and exactly. so on. Yunus Chibri. Thank you. Well, if I understood correctly, the question from Nigeria is not the definition of the universal postal service that they're after, but the definition of postal services. That's in his question, postal services. This means that there's a dichotomy here. And I think the essence here takes precedence over existence. Postal services have always existed because they facilitate communication between um, men and women. It's not simply to share new news at local level, but it's to exchange uh, goods and services. And from that point of view, this need for exchange evolves along with the technological evolution and increasing uh, and diverse requirements. And this means that the, one has to base the definition on that essential characteristic. And as the content has to evolve, well, from our standpoint, I do in, agree with the colleague from Nigeria in that when we talk about the UPU postal network saying that it's multidimensional, it cannot um, walk on one leg, as it were. It's multidimensional. It, there has to be the financial aspect, the physical service, um, the e-services, and one has to view this as a whole in terms of the offering of postal services. So how would you define it, Jack? To take into account what is changing and then we have to make sure that the definition will accommodate with the, this changing world and the needed transformation in postal services. For example, regarding logistics and so on, and also convergence. Regarding USO, I think that, uh, as I said during my presentation, we are revisiting a number of dimensions, and maybe it might help to also rethink about what might be the uh, postal services definition. Mm -hmm. Paul yeah, um, the core definition of postal services, I, I think I gave an overview of that. It's possible to define that. The core, that is the unique thing that postal operators throughout the world are offering today. That is the unique one. But then the government have to decide um, what kind of universal service obligations do we need. And for sure, we need to ensure that citizens are able to communicate, whether this is by mail or by electronic communications, that has to be decided by the government. And further on, we need all the, each and every government have to ensure uh, or discuss whether they want to have a universal service obligations when it comes to parcels. And that is something totally different from communication. So you have to split this in communications, which can be do, done by mail or by electronic means, and parcels, which can only be done by, um, by a physical net network. But that has been done f uh, with or f by many other operators than the designated OOP operators. So that is a, a totally different thing. Thank you. Now I have, um, I can only give two um, interventions to place because we uh, should uh, wrap up and finish this session, otherwise we have nothing to eat. We don't want that because we already had a fantastic engagement this morning. The room was always full. So I give the floor to Uruguay and then to Comore. Uruguay, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes? I do apologize. Um, now, if you could be, be concise. Well, yes, of course I'll be concise if I'm not in, in, interrupted, sir. I will be very brief. The duty to provide universal postal service, this is a human right. This is indeed a 
progress. So we have to define the new, uh, the new services. So what are we going to include in the duty? Because designated operators um, also represent a tool for economic and social development. Now, this is not a question, but a comment. I would like Africa to achieve these changes. It has been working on them for some time, but we're hearing about a universal postal service which could be self-funding. However, this is not to say that we should allow compromise or concession on the provision of these universal postal services. The bags also the bridge uh, over to the remarks from the African colleagues. Now the last intervention I give to uh, Comore. I'm sorry, we. <laughs> the lady of Egypt smiles at me, but still I have some. I have to stop it once. You can bring it, put it forward in the afternoon. My colleague will take it. Okay, yes, good. So Comore, where are you? Uh, oh. Thank you, moderator. I would like to, I represent the um, Comor. We had a question on the intervention of the Ethiopian communication minister. His intervention, we felt, was very interesting regarding the approach to profitability that he set out vis-a-vis uh, -vis the inclusion of postal and telecommunication services. Now, historically, in the Comor, it was the telecommunication service that used the postal network, which his, was a long-established network to sell the telecom services. And I understand that the approach developed by Ethiopia was uh, the reverse, the opposite. In other words, postal services that used the um, telecommunication services. So I would like to hear a little bit more, some explanation on how this works specifically in the market. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to the um, Vice uh, Pr uh, Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister of Ethiopia, and then I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Thank you. Have the floor. Uh, Euro guys is uh, just a comment, and I think it's a both compliment. Uh, if we take the case of uh, Ethiopia, one. Uh, Regarding universal uh, services, by the way, I said uh, two kilo for uh, parcel, it is 20 kilo. I'm sorry for that. Uh, we have already standardized uh, the kind of services that should be offered in all villages. We have 16,000 uh, villages in our country. So the whole uh, intervention of the government is all the villages has to be served by this universal service. So this is a decision by the government, and that is an intervention from the government. Well, uh, this government is working hard on development, so we say this is an instrument to accelerate, especially to get out of poverty. We are still struggling to get out of poverty, and we, need, and we say this is an instrument for us. So there is a conditional obligation and commitment from the government to serve the people, to serve especially the poor. And the, the poorest of the poor are in uh, villages. Regarding the sequencing or uh, the experience you mentioned, yes, in our case, uh, telecom went ahead. By the way, this is also an intervention from the government. So the telecom, the government has decided actually 10 years back to cover all villages by telecom. And we said this is a very good instrument again to get out of poverty spread education, to connect people to health doctors, and to get market information. So this is aligned, again, to get to the, the whole project of supporting people to get out of poverty. So telecom came first. That was uh, the thoughts of the government. So telecommunication is spread in these uh, village areas. Now, this year, actually, we added electronic services to it, and then post. And this is historically how it was uh, designed. Postal actually came lately. So we, we preferred to connect the rural uh, population by telecom first than post. Again, this is a, uh, an initiative by the government. I think we were right in terms of sequencing, but it could have been even done together. 
this is the reflection I have, and thank you so much for your comment and for your uh, identifying actually the reason and your, your interest also to know why we have done that. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, I would like to finish this panel. I thank you very much, panelists, uh, dear gentlemen, for, uh, for participating. And I would like to, to wrap up by uh, saying, I think just the last panel showed that we talk about a right of communicate. That is all that what we said. It's a human right. And uh, that uh, is, of course, uh, Mean, needs a universal service, a post universal service, a telecom universal service, a financial universal service, but it mainly needs inclusion, it needs access, and it needs connectivity. It's these three things which, unfortunately, we've seen the figures this morning, are not given in the whole world, by far not. Most parts, I must say, do not have these three points, inclusion, access, and connective of the human right uh, to communicate. Um, I think in all these discussions, also e-commerce, which is, of course, a fact, whether it's in all, in all the countries of this world, um, e-commerce is the future of the postal services, of the communication, also of the, of the businesses. But also here we have to have two speeds. In one way, in the, in the, in the industrialized countries and in the emerging countries are two different speeds. Um, in the industrialized countries, we have to bring down obstacles, we have to make this trade cheaper and so on, all these things. Customs is a big issue, but still, though there are big efforts done. But of course, we also have to see that in Africa, in some parts of Asia and South America, there are other obstacles to uh, overcome for this right to communicate. The infrastructure has to be done, electricity. It was shown by our African colleagues. Many countries don't have electricity. If you don't have electricity, it's difficult to run a post office. We have to have for that the infrastructure of the post office, of the professional um, teaching of the people who run these post offices, and of course also an address system. And for all this, it can be overcome also by the use of new technologies like uh, telecommunication, mobile, uh, uh, telephony, more SMS and so on. This can, can be done. But with all these things, it needs the engagement of the facilitating by the regulator, by the government, and also, of course, by the, by the UPU. We must be aware that the postal network, that was said in the morning first, is the biggest physical network. We have almost 700,000 postal offices. In some countries, it's by far not enough. We know that. But still, this is a big physical network which has to be used. But uh, it's, it's uh, necessary to have more logistical efficiency, that the costs of trading must go down, and that we design a regional integration. Mail and postal services is not a matter of nation to nation. We must work regionally. And I was, as I said this morning, impressed when I was on the Ivory Coast in Abidjan, Grand Bassam, how, for example, the Eastern and Western African countries work together. It's not a matter of Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Kenya, but they work together, and that's how it should be. That's also what we try here in Europe uh, to do. So, so this must be the future. And the other thing is the red tape. We still have much too much stamps and paper and so on. We need to use the technology, ladies and gentlemen. We are not enough there, everybody who uh, delivers parcels and so on, no, uh, on knows we are going in this direction, but we're not far enough. We need speedy clearing and we need simplified decla declarations. Otherwise, we will never uh, get where we want to go. Peru was a very interesting example. We should take uh, like what they do in uh, South America, but it was also very interesting to listen to the lady from the Caribbean, from uh, how she shows how important for the people who do agriculture, who do small trade, how important it is to have post office, to be physical, able to send off their goods be it nationwide or into another country. So opening these things in, in concrete, in practical ways 
is essential for growth of wealth and for fighting poverty in the whole world. And I think that's, that's something we should take with us. But the colleague from Malaysia uh, gave us an optimistic note. He said, uh, we are going into a golden era for the postal sector because e-government, uh, e, um, because e-business, uh, e-commerce gives tremendous possibilities, tremendous opportunities for the postal services. And that's true because the combination internet and physical logistic de uh, delivery gives tremendous opportunity. And with this positive note of the Malaysian colleague, I would like to finish uh, this uh, panel, but not, uh, not saying we must accept the challenge, try to challenge the postal operators. They must change their minds, set the authorities, the regulators and the government. They have to do big changes to face um, these, these challenges which e-commerce bring to us. With this, I would like to thank you very much, everybody here in the room. I'm impressed. We're all hungry and thirsty, and you're still all here. Uh, that's, uh, that shows that uh, you show a big interest on the topic, and I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion uh, in the afternoon, which my colleague will, will lead. And uh, I wish you all the best, and thanks again for your engagement. And I give now uh, the floor to the Right Honourable Minister of Ivory Coast, Monsieur Kone. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates, first of all, I'd like to thank and commend the speakers uh, at this panel. Thank you, Mark, and thanks to you all for those extremely inter interesting interventions. If I may, I just have a few announcements to make regarding formalities, but first of all, I... If I may, I would like to make a very brief comment on some of the points that were made during this morning's panel. We have all noted with interest everything that was said on the use of ITCs, and I don't th ICTs, I don't think there's any need to dwell on that, e-commerce, which is at the very heart of everything that we have to do in all our postal services in the coming years. We have also noted the very significant traffic uh, with of e-commerce. We've noted the improvement of access to the market, which is a prerequisite in order to enable our populations, especially in the developing countries, to have access to postal services. We noted with interest the proposal that was made on opportunities provided in some countries to um, uh, SMEs and to postal services. And for my part, I have noted the logistical services for access to the internet, which clearly um, is very interesting for many of our countries. Now, the regulatory aspects, well, we're all concerned by that. I think we listen with great interest to the discussions that took place and um, unquestionably we are all convinced that proper regulation enables us to have a postal service that develops better because this means that we have operators who are more dynamic, who can have secure operations and we have consumers who will therefore be protected. The concept of the Universal Postal Service has been discussed. I will not dwell on that, especially since there were some there was some disagreement over the concept of the Universal Postal Service and in particular regarding the definition of the Universal Postal Service itself. But I would, for my part, um, um, recall that we need we really the, the networks have to develop and it's necessary that our states contribute to this our networks 
are facing the challenges of technological development and our states must intervene. And I also note that our networks and our consumers are facing with are facing the cost of postal services and there as well it's perhaps important that our respective states play the role that they should be playing and I also noted that there are requirements that can be covered by the Universal Postal Service internationally particularly the access the availability of postal of post offices for society at large we spoke about um, electrification providing power to some um, post Postal, post offices, and if all this is done, then it will contribute very strongly to the development of the postal service in our countries, and it will help to improve inclusion, and it will help the extension of these services. Mark concluded in talking about the right to communicate. I think this indeed is a, a good summary of what was said during this session. So, now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to just give us a few minutes to enable us to give the floor which is to Switzerland, which has asked for the floor. I don't see... Ah, oh, yes, there is Switzerland. So the Secretary of State has the floor to address the assembled gathering. Thank you, uh, Chair. You are at the junction between information and I would like to share a confidential piece of information which I received a few moments ago whereby the next item on the agenda should involve food, gastronomy. Now I know how difficult it is to listen when on an empty stomach and therefore I've made a stra strategic decision to reduce my intervention to one hour only. Ladies and gentlemen, chairman, ministers, high representatives, director general, representatives of the Universal Postal Union, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honour for me to address you on behalf of the Swiss government as the representative of the host state of the UPU for the sixth Global Strategy Conference of the UPU after the Bern Conference in 1992, Geneva in 97, Geneva in 2002, Dubai in 2006, and Nairobi in 2010. The um, strong participation in this event is really augurs very well, and we're very happy with this. My brief intervention will cover four points. Swiss, Switzerland as the host state, Switzerland as a solid, in its solidarity, Switzerland as a candidate, and Switzerland as a partner for reform. As the host for our Universal Postal Union, Switzerland is happy once again to enable um, dialogue to take place by making available the International Conference Centre of Geneva. You are far removed from your usual, well, not very far, admittedly, uh, from your usual base in Bern. This, you are familiar with this infrastructure because the Universal Postal Congress met here in 2008 under the um, presidency of your current Director General, whom I uh, wish, whom I would like to greet, like many other international organizations based in Switzerland, we are always prepared to facilitate meetings and exchange of views by stakeholders. As the host country to many international organizations, we're all the more aware of the synergies that can be established, and this will be increasingly relevant in the digital era. With this in mind, we will always be prepared to play the role of the facilitator. Swiss for Switzerland for solidarity, as we did for our Kenyan friends in 2008, we are doing this for our friends from Côte d'Ivoire today. We are all from Côte d'Ivoire. We all belong to Côte d'Ivoire. We all know under what circumstances the venue of this conference had to be relocated. The Ebola epidemic moved us all and it, it, it hit some um, member states of the sub-region. Fortunately, in Côte d'Ivoire, there were no instances we are all with Côte d'Ivoire, all with the countries that have been effective. We wish to thank the Ivoirian authorities for all the effort that they had made in order to prepare for the conference that should have been held in Abidjan. Switzerland as a candidate. Swiss, Switzerland is committing itself. Switzerland wishes the initiatives to continue over time. Our role and our involvement in the UPU since its inception uh, over 141 years ago 
are well known and therefore we call for continuity. And it is in this spirit that the Swiss government will ask you to renew your support to our Vice Director General at the International Bureau, Mr. Pascal Cliva, at the next Universal Postal Congress to be held in Istanbul in 2016. We are convinced that he will able, if he is re-elected, to continue the wonderful job that he already been accomplishing with great dedication, competence and enthusiasm. I'm not making diplomatic compliments here because uh, I can... S I can tell you what a diplomat is being asked to say here really does correspond to the truth. Now, as further proof of our commitment to the UPU, my country has decided to be a candidate for a seat on the next Council of Administration. We wish to participate fully in the many challenges that await the Universal Postal Union in the years ahead and to contribute our experience in order to meet these challenges. Switzerland wishes to be very present, very active within the governing bodies of the Union in the next cycle. And finally, Switzerland as a partner in reform. This strategy conference is particularly important because over two days it enables the various parties to the panels and the participants to make their intellectual contribution in defining the strategy of the UPU. Indeed, these will provide the basic elements to establish the broad guidelines for the UPU and to set out its roadmap at the next Istanbul Congress. The Swiss government is arguing for an open, efficient UPU that serves everyone, a UPU that provides value-added solutions in a world that is going through upheaval, as the Director General recorded yesterday, and as we see through the discussions that are being uh, held over these two days. The pace of reform has to be stepped up further in order for the organisation to um, meet its objectives by 2020. The 141 years of the UPU's existence are a success for the postal sector, and the UPU has launched this sector and developed it constantly over this period. This is a very strong guarantee for the future. The Universal Postal Union has become a model of co international cooperation. Long live our second oldest UN agency. Let us continue together the major projects which we are in the process of defining here in Geneva. You may count on the full support of the Swiss government. I wish you an excellent conference or an end of the conference and thank you very much and bon appétit. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates, on your collective behalf, I wish to thank the Secretary of State, who has just intervened on behalf of Switzerland. I wish to thank you, sir, for the very kind words that you um, said about Côte d'Ivoire. And in particular, I wish to thank you for having... Um, agreed to host this Ab the Abidjan conference here in Geneva and to provide us with all of these facilities which have enabled so far uh, a very successful conference to take place. Your message I think has been very well taken on board and I will give the floor to a few people in the room who wish to intervene briefly. Um, regarding Switzerland as the candidate, I wish to convey my own sentiment and, of course, my support to the Swiss candidacy. And publicly, I wish to support the express support for the excellent job that is being done by the Director General and his team. So I give the floor to the room and to all those who wish to intervene. Yes, Mr. Yunus, go ahead. Merci, Thank you, Excellency Minister. Thank you for giving me the opportunity at such a late hour to say a few words after this excellent announcement regarding the four thrusts that Switzerland has set out. Of course, we say that 
um, an empty stomach cannot listen to anything, but that sharpens our appetite further. It whets the appetite because we have just heard the that the winning team will continue to work because traditionally one is always hears that a winning team should not be changed. And on the African side, we Africans, on behalf of the African postal community, with the permission of my president of the Plenipotentiary Commission, I wish to say that Africa has been fully satisfied over the two and a half years of the uh, winning ticket that we have had. And I re needless, need I recall that it's been an African ticket. It was perhaps Swiss, but Basal Kliva and Bishar Hussein were our candidates. They have won a resounding victory and they did not disappoint us at all. So we think that they should continue their job and this would be great for our postal services because under their mandate more than ever cooperation with the Pan-African Postal Union for the benefit of its member states has been further strengthened and we wish this to continue in order to enable them to uh, continue their very good job. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. I will ask the next speakers to be as brief as possible. Uh, Egypt, you have the floor. Uh, نيابة عن الحكومة المصرية أود أن أقدم جزيل الشكر لقيادات الاتحاد البريد العالمي وعلى رأسهم الأستاذ بشار حسين المدير العام ونائبه الأستاذ باسكال كليفاس على مجهوداتهم ومساعيهم المشكورة خلال السنوات الماضية فهم لم يدخروا جهدا في تقديم الدعم المطلوب للدول ونحن نأمل استمرار هذا التعاون المثمر على جميع الأصعدة وشكرا جزيلا. Okay. Thank you. I'm not sure that we understood what you said because I think that the interpretation um, did not work i give the floor to iraq iraq na ayda natakallam bi al arabi al al tarjuma mutaha am la ayda nahnu nashkur fariq al amal je pense que la la traduction arabe ne marche pas and the arabic interpretation is not working we will give our floor the floor to other colleagues and we will give you the floor as soon as the interpretation works thank you Djibouti if you speak English or French hello I just wanted to give the my turn to Egypt which who speak French so that they can put their question in French. English no problem yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> no problem English French no problem Arabic. On behalf of the Egyptian government uh, I wish to thank Mr. Bashar Hussein the general director and his deputy Mr. Pascal Clivas for the effort they uh, spent during the last two years, I strongly believe that they spare no effort to fulfill their commitments and to uh, provide support to all the country. And I wish to continue the fruitful cooperation with the UPU. And thank you very much. Which one is it? Ethiopia. 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 
Go ahead, please, Ethiopia. Alizi, oui. Go ahead, Ethiopia. We also support uh, the coordination of both Secretary General and uh, Deputy Secretary General because they have uh, uh, shown outstanding performance during their stay for the last two and a half years. Thank you. Senegal. Senegal. Donc je vous remercie. Well, thank you. I wish to take the floor simply to say that Senegal commends the work that is being done by the Director General, Mr. Bishar Hussein, and the Vice Director General, Mr. Pascal Cliva. The work for transforming the UPU and the transformation of the Postal Service, we think this work should be continued by the winning team, which should be re-elected, and Senegal feels that Mr. Bishar Hussein and Mr. Pascal Cliva should be re-elected for the next cycle. Thank you. Well, I see many other hands raised, but I think that the comment comments will all be going in the same direction. So on your collective behalf, I wish to thank the Secretary of State. I wish to commend the team which is running the UPU, commend it for its wonderful job and also congratulate it on the support that most delegates have just voiced. So thank you. Thank you very much. Je voudrais... Now, I said that we had other priorities and the next priority, of course, is the culinary aspect, so I now invite you to lunch, which is being hosted by Côte d'Ivoire, uh, in the building. Thank you, and see you later at 2 p.m. We start at 2